Hello, deserving listeners. So after I posted episodes on Joffrey and Ramsay from Game of Thrones, a lot of people have asked me, really yelled at me <laughs> to do an episode about Cersei Lannister. So let's do a deep dive on Cersei. This episode is going to be long, so strap in and get ready for a long... Is that the right phrase? Strap yourself in and get ready for a long episode. Today, we're going to talk about the family history of Cersei and her family, going back to her grandfather. We're going to talk about her childhood, her life. Maybe I'll speculate about where this character will end up in the books and on the TV show in the future. We're going to analyze her personality, and at the end, I'll talk about some trivia regarding Lena Headey, the the you know the actress who plays her wonderfully on the HBO TV show. Also, know that I'm going to spoil the entire seasons one through six. So as I'm posting this, it's early 2017 before season seven. So this won't include any information from season seven of the TV show or from the sixth book. But I'm here to spoil everything. So, but I- I'm going to take a guess and say that anyone who is interested in listening to this has already watched all the episodes at least once, if, ne- if, if not a number of times like I have. So, uh, so just know that. And um, if you haven't ever watched the show, uh, I highly recommend it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University in Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. So let's provide some background. Let's go back to Cersei's grandfather, Titus, Titus Lannister. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Titus Lannister. So I'm going to give a lot of information that precedes the books in the TV show. So he was Lord of Casterly Rock and head of House Lannister, just as you would suspect. He was the father of Tywin Lannister and Kevin Lannister. He also had some other children that I won't go into. He is the grandfather, as I said, of Cersei, Jaime, Tyrion, and Lancel, among other great-grandchildren. Tidos presided over a period of decline for House Lannister. He lost much of the family fortune on poor investments. He was mocked by others in court. He was perceived as being a very weak leader. So just think about that for a second. It's hard to imagine. This is Tywin's father, Tidos Lannister, was bad with money and he was weak. So this perception of weakness, you know, in the world of Game of Thrones, whenever there's a perception of weakness, uh, the lesser houses rebelled against House Lannister in, a, in a, an attempt to overthrow it or gain power themselves or something. But the young Tywin, who was old enough to fight himself, he was a ruthless general and put down the rebellion And his ruthlessness in the war against these lesser houses gave a darker meaning to the common phrase for the Lannisters, a Lannister always pays his debts. So, you know, before Tywin came along, the phrase a Lannister always pays his debts just referred to money. Because Casterly Rock is, uh, they own a bunch of gold mines. There's a lot of gold mines uh, where in that land. And so they just have, they can just print their own money, so to speak. And so they always have a ton of money. So they've always been, they've always been able, Lancers have always been able to pay their debts because they have a ton of money. But after Tywin put down this rebellion that was against his father, uh, a Lannister always pays his debts has a darker meaning, which is often referred to in the TV show and in the books. So, so let's let's just pause for a second in this story and, and really look at this. So Tywin, Cersei's father, grew up in a house that was declining. He was Tywin is probably ashamed of his father. He probably internalized that shame. And Tywin's pride and his fierceness and his ruthlessness brought the house back from the dead. 
So just think about that for a second. You're, you're, I don't know, 20 years old or something, and your father is slowly, you know, declining the house, is slowly, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, presiding over a house that's, that's failing. His, you know, so you're watching your father just fail and fail and fail, and all these other people are looking at you as the son of a failure. And then just as your house is about to completely be obliterated, you, you know, engage with your own rage and your own ruthlessness and you march and you have to, you're afraid, you know, imagine Tywin and his fear of, of this rebellion, because it could have gone another way, but Tywin in his ruthlessness and his, and his, and his fierceness puts down this rebellion for his father, you know, his, his father didn't do it, he did it. So now he's rising above his own father. He's been elevated above his father. His, his father is probably looking to Tywin as, as stronger than he is. And this, you know, what this would do to your personality, for Tywin's personality, in terms of uh, giving him his perhaps his only source of self-esteem, which was to, was to be ruthless. He grew up probably feeling lesser self-esteem, but then when he was ruthless and eliminated this, because it's not just eliminating the rebellion, but the news via the, the, the crows spread throughout the kingdoms and, and talk about Tywin, this young upstart who you know, was ruthless and, and managed to put the Lannister house back on the map. There's a lot of fame, and there's a lot of there's a lot of power in in that, and the amount of self esteem that Tywin would have would have gotten from that, and also how he might be a, 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 he might develop narcissism because of this, because a lot of people probably praised him, including his own father, and so at a young age he was considered better than his own father. Now, I'm, I'm making a lot of speculations, and obviously this is a fictional book, a fictional story, so it didn't really happen. But, but I, you know, I think the way that Martin writes, it's close enough to reality that we could think of it as, as being an accurate portrayal of what could happen in an example like this. And so, you know, Tywin might have developed a complex regarding his self-esteem, linking it to all of these things. And, it, and that... Uh, informs us in terms of looking forward. Plus, Tywin knows what it's like to have his house decline. He knows what it's like to have weakness perceived by others and what what bad things can happen because of that. And so he is hypervigilant, perhaps even suffering from some trauma reactions. He's hypervigilant about making sure that his house is always perceived as strong and ruthless and himself as always perceived as strong and ruthless. He's because he's worried about things going back to the way he was when he was a kid. And and so it's a lot of weight to carry and probably doesn't leave a lot of room for him to be a nice, warm father, because his way of loving his children is to keep his house strong, which is akin to keeping his children alive. Because if you're perceived as weak, then other people will destroy you and maybe even kill your kids. And so his dedication to his family is very clear. And he equates ruthlessness with with love. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. That Tywin, there, it, we can understand why he became the way that he was. So Tywin married his cousin, Joanna Lannister, which was common in real royalty at the time and in the Game of Thrones world. Their first children were the twins, Cersei and Jaime. Cersei was born first. And I, I always think it's funny how that matters to us with twins. It's like who just randomly came out first. But you, when you talk to twins, most twins, they're... They're, they're always pretty clear about who was born first. Plus, people often ask. I, I have a friend who's a twin, and, and on Sunday I asked him who was born first because I, 
I probably have asked him that question before, but I don't know. I was just making conversation and, and, you know, so, and I actually forgot the answer. So now I have to ask again. But anyway, the point is, is that it's funny that it matters to us because, you know, your bigger brother or sister, your older quote unquote brothers, even if it's just 10 minutes older, that person's still your older sibling, right? And it, I don't know, it's just funny how age plays such a role, even if it's just 10 minutes older. And can you really call it older? I mean, <laughs> uh, anyway, you were conceived at the exact same time, right? Yeah. Um, well, actually, can fraternal twins, I think fraternal twins can can be conceived at different times. So that'd be the real question, is who was conceived first, which of course they wouldn't know the answer, unless there was a test tube baby situation. Anyway, I'm going down a road I should probably avoid since I have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, Cersei was born first. Jamie was h holding on to Cersei's foot as as he was born. So <laughs> just imagine that, that, you know, they're uh, pulling Cersei free and there's this little hand holding on to Cersei's foot. Is this a symbolism? Uh, is this symbolic of their relationship? Perhaps. And then four years later, when Cersei was four, Jamie was four, uh, jo Joanna Lannister, Tywin's wife, Cersei's mom, died giving birth to Tyrion. And Tywin took this very hard. Uh, I'm guessing that Joanna was quite dear to Tywin. And naturally, Cersei took it pretty hard too. It, it appears to me that Joanna Lannister, Tywin's, Tywin's wife, was perhaps the warmth and attachment-oriented person in the family. And when she was gone, the whole family just lost its glue and its, its central warmth in the family. There's not a lot of evidence of that, but it seems like a viable hypothesis. Tywin blamed Tyrion for the death, which is, you know, quite stupid, but um, but uh, there's that. And Cersei did also. So Cersei and Tywin both blamed Tyrion for the death of Joanna. She prayed for days, as Cersei did, hoping that the gods would give her mother back. So Cersei was, was really obviously upset that her mother died so suddenly. By the way, there's a theory that Joanna cheated on Tywin and that Tyrion is not Tywin's son, and that's why Tywin is always so mean to Tyrion and refuses and refuses to let Tyrion become the head of the household because Tywin either knows or suspects that Tyrion is not actually uh, his own son, but he acted as if Tyrion was his son so he could save his wife and his family the the indignity of, of his wife giving birth to a quote unquote bastard. Um, so, uh, and, and I at first didn't think this, but as time went on, as, as I rewatched a lot of episodes, there's, there's some hints, there's some game of Thrones hints. Let's just put it that way. They're not really hints, but they're the, you know, it's like the hints that Jon Snow was actually not, uh, Eddard's son there were quote unquote hints sprinkled throughout the seasons, but I never picked up on them until someone pointed them out to me. And so in the same way, if you really look for these quote unquote hints, you, there's sort of hints that Tyrion is not Tywin's son, but I don't know. There, it doesn't, there, I'm not hearing a lot of talk about that one. So I'm not sure if I'm just completely making it up or not, but anyway, so Tywin became head hand of the King to Ares the second, uh, Ares Targaryen II for 20 years. This is the Mad King. So so Tywin was for 20 years hand of the king to the Mad King. And I'm guessing that Tywin had a lot to do with holding the kingdom together during this time. So at this time when Tywin is hand of the king and he has to spend all his time in King's Landing with the king, Cersei is basically an orphan because dad's in King's Landing he came home very infrequently, and he was reportedly not a very warm father to begin with. He, Cersei's mother is dead, and so Cersei, Jaime, and and uh, Tyrion are all raised by servants, which it just occurred to me 
why Tyrion might be so attracted to prostitutes because he was raised by servants. I know that sounds kind of ugly, but um, I don't know, just the random thought. But anyway, so so Cersei was raised by servants. Mom was dead. Dad was absent. So just imagine that. You know, you're you're raised, and th- these aren't the sort of servants like nannies today. I mean, these these are servant servants, you know, these are sometimes slaves. And you, as a six-year-old, n- somewhat know that if you wanted to, you could have your caregiver killed, <laughs> you know, if you accused one of your one of your servants of stealing or doing something evil, your your dad would kill the servant and and imagine what that would do to your personality meaning that um you know when you're six and you do something wrong particularly if you have a propensity to do something wrong as i'm sure cersei was you need limits you need someone to impose discipline and to be uh, close and warm with you but also to provide you with with limits so that you understand that you aren't the center of the universe and although this wasn't commented on in the books, as far as I remember, Cersei was raised in an environment where that was not the case. She was essentially spoiled beyond spoiled, right? And so there's that. Now, she did have her twin brother, and they were very close. So Jamie was really the only person that she felt close to. And something that was not really portrayed in the TV show is that in the books, Jamie and Cersei look extremely similar. In fact, as young children, they would trick other people by dressing up as each other into thinking that the other person was the other person. Cersei would dress up as a as a little boy, and she was allowed to, uh, and everyone thought she was Jamie. And then she would practice with swords and weapons and stuff as if she were Jamie. And even Tywin, her her own father, couldn't tell them apart when they were dressed the same. And they also slept together in the same bed, which, you know, you could imagine that being true among young twins. They uh, began to experiment sexually with each other, which isn't terrible. I mean, let's, you know, let's not be puritanical here. Young children will, will experiment age appropriate. And they did. Uh, as as very young children, as three, four-year-olds, they would, I don't know, they didn't describe it in detail in the books, but they would they would do stuff to each other. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, there's a lot of thoughts about that that I could say. On one hand, it's completely natural and understandable. If you have young children, it's likely that you've seen your young daughter or, or young son sort of touch themselves as a as a curiosity <laughs> or even as a so- self-soothing thing. Um, and it's completely normal and it's normal for twins to to sort of participate in that together. But you know, it could become problematic if it leads to abuse or developing sexual issues, which, it seems that it did for Cersei and Jaime. Um, but anyway, so they're very young, and they were discovered by a servant experimenting in this way with each other. And the servant told their their parents, no, their mother, sorry, uh, the father was never told about this. So this is when the mother was still alive, when they were, th- so Cersei and Jaime were three or four years old. The servant ran and told th- their mother, and their mother uh, demanded that the servants separate them, and so they were never able to sleep in the same bed again, and Jamie slept on the other side of the castle, and they didn't have a lot of contact. So just imagine that one. <laughs> you're Cersei, you're a young child, and your father is cold and distant. You have your mother, which is good, and you also have your twin brother. And so you have these two people that are very important. In some ways, your twin brother is perhaps even more important than your mom because uh, your mom comes and goes, but your twin brother is always there. You're always, you know, since, since conception, you're right next to your twin brother. 
and you develop a language amongst yourselves, and you're extremely close. And then among your various activities you engage in, one of them happens to be a sexual experimentation, which is, again, normal. And then one day a servant catches you, and again, an underling, just think, remember that, a servant catches you, and you're just instantly separated from one of the two people that you are attached to. And, and we're not talking just, you know, m- emotional attachment. We're talking physical attachment where she's, you know, they're, they're probably cuddling at night, uh, which is a good thing for, for human beings to have human contact. And then, boom, you're just completely separated because of sexual experimentation, which, of course, is, you know, at risk of creating a complex for you regarding sexuality and sexuality with your brother. A more uh, healthy approach might have been to allow them to still have contact with each other and slowly kind of wean them away from each other while at the same time helping them understand their bodies and sexuality and what they're doing so that they can be quote-unquote quote-unquote appropriate but so so this is a this is a pretty big deal. So we have Cersei losing her mother, which is a big deal, and then we have Cersei uh, as a young child being completely ripped away from her twin brother, which is not going to be a good thing for you and your emotional development. So I just want to take a a, a, sh- a little pause here to talk about some evidence of psychopathy regarding Cersei probably as a result of, maybe even a result of genetics, since Tywin has some psychopathic traits, clearly. Uh, But uh, she also was neglected, and she had significant losses as a young child, which raises the risk of psychopathy. Essentially, when you're not given enough empathy, you don't learn how to have empathy for other people. And you don't develop the brain pathways involved in empathy and blah, 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 especially if you have a genetic disposition as such, which it seems you know likely that she would have. But let's look at some other evidence of psychopathy. One, she was fearless. She wasn't afraid of these pet lions that they kept in the dungeon, and Jamie had to save her from these lions because she was running around in the cages. She was, and there's other evidence throughout her life that she doesn't have any fears, or she doesn't heed fears anyway. And also that she was sadistic. She took pleasure in harming other people and didn't have empathy for other people as a, as a young person, as a, not as a three- or a four-year-old, but older than that. As an example, she would abuse Tyrion when Tyrion was a baby. There's talk on the TV and in the books of how she would torture the baby Tyrion and show off to other people and, you know, see, look what I can do. I can, you know, pinch him and torture him. And so, you know, that's, that's signs of, of developing psychopathy. I think some people are confused about psychopathic children because they just can't imagine children being psychopathic, but but they absolutely can be. We don't typically diagnose children with psychopathy, but we usually will, uh, the the childhood version of psychopathy or any social personality disorder is conduct disorder, and, so, and to a lesser extent, oppositional defiant, but, but uh, we certainly see it, and it can be very distressing. And we're cautious about diagnosing kids with psychopathy because there are plenty of kids who exhibit psychopathic traits as children, but quote unquote grow out of it, or as an adult don't exhibit any psycho, or they don't exhibit significant psychopathic traits. And therefore, when we look back, we might hypothesize that their environment was creating the circumstances by which they would have difficulty empathizing with other people, but as adults, they access their their empathy or, or something. And so, um, anyway, why did I go down that road? Okay, so at 15 years old, Cersei and her friend, this is um, depicted at the beginning of season five, Cersei and her friend visited a witch in the woods 
to uh, Cersei wanted to have her fortune told, and I think she was trying to show off to her friend that she was brave and fearless and that cool, and that she could go to the witch in the woods. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine what that would be like today. You know, you have two 15-year-old girls today, and one of them is, I guess it'd be drugs, right? So two 15-year-old girls today, one of them's trying to show off, and she's like, you know, I can smoke pot, or I can, you know, I can drink a whole bunch of booze, or or I don't know. I don't know what it would be two 15-year-olds today. But anyway, so that's essentially the tone of it. And the witch gives Cersei her fortune, and she says a very interesting fortune. She says that Cersei would marry the king. You know, Cersei's like, you know, what prince am I going to marry? And this fortune teller says, she says, actually, you're not going to marry a prince. You're going to marry the king. And while the king will have 20 sons, you, Cersei, will bear only three children. So that was a confusing prophecy to her 15-year-old mind because she was still romantic about love and and marriage and stuff and so she's like wait so my husband the king will have 20 children but i'm only but i'm only going to have three that doesn't make any sense and the fortune said the fortune the witch said that she would outlive her children that her children would die and the fortune teller said that although cersei you will be queen you will be cast down by a younger and more beautiful queen so just think about that one. And then she also said that uh, she used the, the high Valyrian word for younger brother, but she said that a younger brother will end your life, Cersei, a younger brother. Okay, so let's look at this fortune really carefully here. So the witch was right about a lot of things. She did indeed marry the king. She didn't marry a prince. She married King Robert Baratheon. The king did have many children, maybe, you know, 20-ish or something, but the king did have a lot of children because he had sex with a lot of women in the kingdom. And Cersei did indeed have three children. And as we know, again, spoiler alert, uh, we learn that she outlived all of her children. But she has yet to be cast down. So, you know, they, she's, you know she says she will be cast down by a younger and more beautiful queen, not a younger, more beautiful woman, but a, but a younger, more beautiful queen. So when we first saw this, this prophecy, we, I did, I thought it was Marjorie. I thought they were referring to Marjorie, right? A, a younger, more beautiful queen, Marjorie, will, will put you down. But uh, Marjorie's dead now. So, so, that, so it's not, unless Marjorie comes back from the dead or something, but that doesn't seem likely. Um, so so now it's like, well, what other queen? Well, we have Queen Daenerys or Danny. Uh, certainly, you could say she's younger and more beautiful. Uh, although the talk of Cersei's beauty is such that no one's more beautiful than her. But anyway, at least Daenerys is younger. Um, another person I sort of randomly thought was, was Melisandre. Uh, maybe she'll become queen and she'll put her down. Another person is Ilaria Sand. She's the woman in the South who is rising up uh, and might, and obviously she hates Cersei uh, for killing her brother, her brother, her lover, uh, for killing the Viper. Anyway, Sansa is, is will Sansa uh, be the one to put her down? Arya. Gilly will <laughs> maybe Gilly will rise up and be queen and put Cersei down, but I'm gonna guess that it's either Danny or or Sansa is going to be the younger queen who puts down Cersei. Although I really hope it's Sansa, that would be really sa satisfying. <laughs> but it's I don't know. It seems likely it's Daenerys. So we'll see. This other line in the prophecy is a younger brother will end her life. Younger brother. Now, is it her younger brother or is it just a younger brother? I don't really know. So the obvious person to choose here is Tyrion, right? It's, it's got to be Tyrion. Well, okay, I got to take a break and when we get back, we'll continue this conversation. Okay, we're back from the break. Before I go into talking about 
about this younger brother that is going to end Cersei's life, I just want to remind everyone that they should become a patron by going to patreon.com. That's patreon.com. Go to Patreon. Go to patreon.com, become a patron of the podcast. When you become a patron, you get access to all of our premium episodes. We do a lot of deep dives on a lot of topics, and about half of the deep dives are only available to patrons of the podcast. Plus, know that part of your pledge goes towards charities that we support, including charities for homeless people, LGBT people, and also to animals for Pets, petfinder.com is our next charity of choice. Also, tell a friend or colleague about the show. That's that's how people learn about us. Also, rate us on iTunes because that's how also people learn about us. Also, if you're interested, you can join the Facebook fan group. That's run by famous patron Lyndon. And you can also follow us on Instagram, although I don't know really how Instagram exactly works. Uh, I'm, I'm giving it a shot. Okay, so the, the witch says to Cersei, a younger brother will end your life. Is this Tyrion? Could be. He's at the end of season six on the TV show anyway. He's coming for her with Daenerys and her armies and her dragons. So it seems possible that Tyrion could be the one to end her life. Or is it Jon Snow? I mean, Jon Snow is the younger brother of Rob Stark. So is it Jon Snow the one? Now, this prophecy, when she heard it, Cersei hears this prophecy, wait, my younger brother is going to end my life. She instantly thought of Tyrion because she already had a really, con, you know, conflictual relationship with Tyrion and hated Tyrion. So she's like, of course, Tyrion is going to be the one to put me down. And so this just fueled her anger and hatred towards Tyrion. The other one here is what about Jamie? Right? Jamie was younger, so to speak, just by a a couple minutes. And Jamie is the King Slayer. So why can't he be the Queen Slayer? You know, maybe, may, you know, maybe this is all going to turn out just like the Mad King did. This is the Mad Queen in terms of her, her propensity to use wildfire to obliterate, you know, a, lots of people to her benefit. You know, we can imagine a scenario in which Daenerys and Tyrion and Varys are closing in on King's Landing, and then uh, Cersei is like, "Okay, you know, I'm going to blow up the city and kill everyone, including myself, because if I'm going to die, everyone's going to die." And then Jaime comes out of nowhere and kills Cersei to prevent that from happening. We can, you know. That would be poetic. It'd be a little too poetic, a little too obvious in some ways. But you know, we could we could imagine that happening. And man, can you just imagine that scene? <laughs> Jesus, uh, which makes me just I just can't wait for the next couple seasons to see what's going to happen. I mean, just the last c couple episodes of season six were were just. I mean, if I saw those as individual movies in the theater, I'd be like, whoa, that was an amazing movie. I mean, these these episodes are just so good. So I just, I have high expectations for seasons seven and eight. But anyway, so younger brother going to end her life. Is it Tyrion? Is it Jon Snow? Is it Jaime? Is it someone else? I mean, the witch was right about all the other elements of the, of the uh, prophecy. And so um, we shall see. Anyway, so this prophecy freaked Cersei out, and apparently the superstition at the time was that if you never spoke of the prophecy again, it wouldn't come true. And so her and her friend are the, are the only ones who have heard this prophecy, and so Cersei's like, okay, if me and my friend never never talk about this prophecy, it won't come true, because it sounds horrible. <laughs> I mean, my kids are going to die before me, some queen's going to kill me. Uh, Tyrion's going to kill me. I mean, this is this is awful. Well, of course, of course, the psychopathic Cersei. What does she do? I mean, because you know she could ask her friend, "Please do not ever say this prophecy ever again. I beg you, do not repeat it because I'm worried about it." Is Cersei even a young fifteen-year-old Cersei the sort of person that's going to leave that up to chance? No, of course, the friend mysteriously dies soon after this visit with the witch. It's implied that Cersei killed her to prevent her from speaking the prophecy, but we don't know that for sure. But let's let's just assume that Cersei had had the girl killed. 
Okay. So now, Tywin, let's get back to Tywin here. He's hand of the king to the Mad King Ares. So Tywin asks the Mad King if his daughter Cersei could marry Prince Rhaegar. This would make uh, this would make Cersei the queen eventually. And the king, I think, I think Rhaegar was next in line. Um, the king rejected Tywin's proposal. Why the the king rejected Tywin's proposal, it's unclear. I think the Mad King was just crazy and kind of a dick. But uh, anyway, Tywin, you know, was a loyal hand of the king for 20 years. And he's like, hey, I'd just like my, you know, Prince Rhaegar to, to marry my daughter. And, and the king's like, nope. And Cersei then learns that Tywin was, uh, because, you know, Tywin, again, think Tywin. Okay, all he's thinking about is, I got to uphold the family household. I've got to make it strong. And and one of the one of the biggest tools you have as a as the head of a household is marrying your daughters off. And when you marry your daughters off, you you cement a, alliances with that with that house because presumably you wouldn't attack a another house if your daughter was a part of that. And also you wouldn't attack your, you know, wife's father's house, right? So it really, you know, cements houses together. So Cersei learns that Tywin is thinking about Jamie at this point. He's thinking, okay, well, I can't get rid of Cersei, but I could get rid of Jamie. I mean, get rid of, but, you know, marry Jamie off. And so Tywin is like, okay, I'm going to marry Jamie into uh, the Tully household, Lysa Tully. You know, she's in the TV show. She's the, the crazy moon door woman who flies out of the moon door. Moon door? That's what's called, right? So Cersei learns that Tywin is going to marry Jaime to Lysa Tully. Uh, imagine that match. <laughs> but um, Cersei wanted Jaime for herself. So she seduces Jaime and convinces him to ask the king to make him one of the king's guards. Because as we know, the king's guards, they can't get married. And Jaime asked the king to become a king's guard to avoid having to move out of King's Landing and Mary Lysa Tully. And the king agreed and made Jamie join the King's Guard. And what this did was it robbed Tywin of his sole heir that he liked, right? So Tywin has one has two sons. He has Jamie and Tyrion, but he hates Tyrion. And Tyrion is has a bad reputation anyway. And so and he has a daughter, and and in his family, he's in the Lannister household. Other other households are more liberal about allowing women to rule and or have have power, like the Martells, I believe, or like the Tyrells. But Tywin and the Lannisters didn't hold to this liberal attitude about women, and so he just has he just has his son Jamie, and. Now, Jamie has been made the king's guard by the king, and so this robbed Tywin of his heir, which was a, a bad idea uh, for the mad king. You know, it's like, why would you piss off the richest man in Westeros? In fact, if if the king had not done this to to Jamie, if the king had said, no, Jamie, you can't become the king's guard, you're Tywin's only heir. And also, if the mad king had said, yes, Tywin, Cersei can marry my son, the Mad King and the Targaryens would probably still be in power because I'll get more to that in a second. But anyway, so then uh, Tywin resigns his hand of the king. He's like, fuck this shit. And he goes back to Casterly Rock. So then Robert's rebellion happens. So Robert and Eddard rise up against the Mad King and Tywin remains neutral, even though it was would be assumed that Tywin would rush to the Mad King's aid, Tywin's like, look, I'm going to stay out of this because I hate the king and I hate the Baratheons. I hate everyone. And I'm just going to hold tight on this one. But when it was clear that that Robert Baratheon was going to win the war, Tywin joined the fight. And But instead of fighting, he decided to use a trick and he came, he marched his armies to King's Landing and sent a message to the Mad King, and he said, I'm here to help you defend King's Landing against uh, the Baratheons and the Starks. 
and uh, you know the Mad King's advisors was like, uh, I don't know if you should trust Tywin, and he, and even Jamie, since he was one of the Kingsguard, well, said, look, I don't think Tywin, my father, is likely to uh, be on your side on this, but the king fell for Tywin's trick and opened the gates for him. And Tywin immediately ordered his men to sack the city and massacre the royal family. Well, King Ares, uh, the Mad King, then ordered Jaime to bring him Tywin's head, which, you know, is an interesting order. And Jaime also knew that the Mad King had a bunch of wildfire spread throughout the city. And the Mad King was, you know, told his royal pyromancer, (laughs) he has a royal pyromancer, to set the entire city ablaze, which, you know, would have killed, I don't know how many people, but King, the Mad King is like, okay, it's over for me. Tywin is in the city. Baratheon and Stark are going to be here soon. It's over for me. I'm a crazy man. And I want to, I want to kill everybody. Now there are theories that the Mad, just as a side note, uh, many of you may know this, but there's a theory that the Mad King uh, was was seeing the future in that he was seeing the army of the dead and the White Walkers and everything uh, invade the the South, and he was confusing that future with the current and. He, he set the he, he wanted to set the city on fire because he thought he was actually destroying the army of the dead when in fact he was actually destroying his own people and it's you know you know how hodor became hodor because of bran and the man in the tree and all that kind of mind stuff <laughs> if the, you know he basically accidentally fried hodor's brain well I think in seasons seven and eight, and again, I have no inside knowledge on this, so I'm not spoiling anything. I'm just, I'm just spouting. I'm going to be spouting a lot of speculation. I'm usually wrong about these sorts of things. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I'm usually very wrong, but, um, but anyway, to spout a little bit about this, I think it's possible that Bran is going to fry the Mad King's brain on accident and make them. In, in the past, because we know that Bran can actually travel time now. He can, and because that's how he fried Hodor's brain. He went into the past and fried Hodor's brain. And uh, and so I think it's possible that Bran or somebody is going to go back in time and potentially fry the Mad King's brain, and, and then that's going to cause the Mad King to you know try to do all the weird stuff that he was doing. But anyway, so... So King Ares says to Jamie, I want you to kill your father and bring me his head. And I want, and I'm also, uh, you know, by the way, I'm going to blow up the entire city. So Jamie's like, okay, um, I think it's time to kill this king. And so he stabs the mad king in the back and thus saving, I don't know, countless people, including his own father, and really just putting the mad king out of his misery. And he got the the uh, horrible nickname, the Kingslayer, for his service to the community, which is, I think, just mean. So when Robert Baratheon and Eddard Stark reached the Red Keep, Tywin presented the bodies of the royal family as proof that he was on their side. And this is no small feat, considering how hard it is to take a defended keep. So, um, you know, Tywin you know, did, did something pretty great for the community and for Baratheon and, and, and Stark. So Robert Baratheon becomes king. Tywin asked Robert to marry Cersei to cement the alliance between House Baratheon and, and House Lannister. And Robert probably recognized the importance of this alliance because Tywin had a lot of money and a very strong army. So he said, yes, Robert Baratheon said, yes, I will marry Cersei, even though Robert was in love with Lyanna. Okay, so let's go on to the marriage. All right, so again, after I go through all this back history, which I think is important to understand, to understand Cersei's personality, I'm going to talk about her personality and and a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, so now we're, again, we're we're still before the books and the TV show. (laughs) So the royal marriage between Cersei and Robert, King Robert Baratheon, she was, there's different accounts of this, but I think in the books, 
she was 17, maybe 18 when she got married, and he was 21. So pretty, I think, typical age range for people getting married at the time. The morning of the wedding, Cersei had sex with Jamie. by the way. <laughs> That's a little, little tidbit for you. At first, Cersei was really infatuated with the handsome, strapping Robert. Now, if you remember from the TV shows, Robert Baratheon is played by a rather rotund guy who can't fit into his armor anymore. But when he was younger, he was he was a manly man. You know, think young Burt Reynolds <laughs> or something. You know, a hairy manly man, or Marlon, a young Marlon Brando, shall we say? And Cersei still had this very romantic prince and princess kind of view of marriage. And Robert was a rock star. He was super, he was young and exciting and powerful and manly. And and everyone loved him because he got rid of the Mad King and and he was, you know, the savior. And she was going to, she was going to marry this guy. And she was really infatuated with him. And although she was still having sex with Jamie, which seems like a constant sort of element in her life, she she legitimately wanted things to work out between her and Robert Baratheon. But then on their wedding night, I think while they were having sex, Robert called out to Lyanna, to Lyanna Stark, to Eddard's uh, sister. And Cersei was naturally hurt by that. She's like, wait, what? You... You love someone else. You don't love me. And in the books, uh, Cersei became pregnant with Robert's child. In the TV and in the books, she became pregnant. But in the books, she aborted Robert's child because she hated Robert by this point. And in the TV, she actually did have did give birth to the son, but uh, the son died shortly after birth. And so that's a major difference between the books and, and the TV show. And I'm, I think it's because maybe the TV people wanted Cersei to be more likable because there were so many reasons to hate Cersei. There's this, I think it's a scene where Cersei's actually talking to Eddard's wife, Catelyn Stark, and Cersei is saying like, yeah, I, I did have a son with dark hair and he died shortly after birth. And I think they were trying to humanize Cersei a little bit. But in the books, Cersei, upon becoming pregnant with Robert's son, aborts it somehow uh, because she hates Robert so much. So this is a traumatic experience. Imagine you get married, things you know become completely different than you thought it would, your husband is in love with this other woman. You're, you know, second fiddle to this other woman. You become pregnant. You're angry. You don't know what to do. You're, you know, you, you want to strike back at your husband. And he's a, he's, he drinks a lot. He's violent. He's, uh, you know, braggadocious. So you decide to have an abortion. I mean, abortions are traumatic regardless of the circumstances. And under this circumstance, it's, you know, highly traumatic. And so then Cersei just and Robert become more and more conflictual over time. Cersei's hatred for Robert deepens. Uh, she actively avoids getting pregnant by Robert. And she returned to her safe place, her brother, Jamie. Jamie's the only person on the planet who she's been able to depend upon other than her mother, but her mother's dead. She can't depend on her father. She can't depend on Tywin. She hates Tywin and no one else she can depend on. So she goes to Jamie. And guess what? She has three child three children by Jamie, Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen, all product of the relationship with Jamie. And and Jamie was actually even present at some of the births, if and at least Joffrey's birth, even though Robert was not present. Robert was always out hunting on purpose. He avoided when when ever Cersei went into labor, Robert would go hunting because he thought, well, I'd, I don't want to be around for that. And so, so this is just more reasons why Cersei hated, hated Robert. They fought a lot. They drank a lot. They were violent. Cersei hit him with a drinking horn, you know, some sort of drinking thing. 
and chipped his tooth. So they were quite quite violent with each other. I'm guessing Cersei got the short end of the stick on that one since Robert is so much larger than she is and he's the king. So she has her three children and as Joffrey, her oldest son, his sadism becomes more apparent. Robert wanted to have one of his bastard children become his heir. So so just imagine that. Your your son, your beautiful blonde son, Joffrey, is a, you know, the next king. And you're so proud of that. You're like, my son is going to be king of Westeros and Westeros, Seven Kingdoms. And my husband hates our son and is going to bring one of his mistress's children, and I think it was a like a girl too, <laughs> home and live with us and groom that child to be his heir. You know, that's not going to go over so well, especially with a person like Cersei. And so Cersei said, if you bring that child into this castle, I cannot, I mean, this is paraphrasing, but I can't vouch for the safety of that child. And so Robert's like, whoa, did she just threaten to kill my child from another woman? Okay. And so Robert, from that that point forward, said, okay, I guess I have to never uh, reveal these bastard kids to Cersei, my wife. Cersei even was rumored to have killed two of the bastard children as babies or had them killed, right? She learned about these twins who were born to Robert by another woman and had them killed. So there was all that kind of interesting (laughs) dynamic between Robert and Cersei. So now we're almost at the beginning of the books in the TV show. Stannis Baratheon, Robert's younger brother, noticed that the the three children were all blonde and blue-eyed, even though King Robert and all the other Baratheons, for that matter, were all dark-haired and (laughs) dark-eyed. So, wait a second, you know, uh, we all know that when you put a blonde and a brunette together, you tend to get more brunette children. And Stannis is like, this is weird. All three of Robert's children are like the Lannisters, super blonde, beautiful, blue-eyed creatures. And so he's like, wait a second, I bet you anything. And it's, and the rumors about Jamie and Cersei were, you know, in the society. And so, but at the very least, Stannis is like, I don't know if these are Jamie's kids, but these clearly are not my brother Robert's kids. And if this was true, this would make Stannis the heir to the throne, uh, I think. Uh, there's a complicated way of calculating things when you don't have an heir, a legitimate heir in the royal family and these kinds of societies. And so I think the way that it worked was that if Robert didn't have any legitimate children, then that would make Stannis the younger brother potentially next in line. And so Stannis talks with John Aaron, Hand of the King. Uh, John Aaron was the mentor of of King Robert and Eddard Stark. So Stannis talks with John Aaron, and you know I'm guessing others suspected that this too. They're looking at the kids and they're like, I, I don't think those are Robert's kids, but no one else really stood to gain from the risk of making that accusation. I mean, if you're just some random noble person and you just are like, hey, I think those kids are not Robert Baratheon's kids. I mean, not only would Robert potentially be insulted and have you killed, but certainly Cersei (laughs) would have you killed, right? So there's not a lot of reason for anyone to come out and just, you know, say it publicly. But Stannis benefited because if Stannis came forward and managed to get everyone on his side, then he potentially would be next in line as king. And I'm also guessing that John Aaron was concerned about, you know, so John Aaron's the hand of the king, and he's watching little Joffrey grow up, and he's like, uh, I don't know, I don't think Joffrey's going to be that great of a king because he's a little sadistic person. And so when Stannis Baratheon comes to John Aaron and says, look, I think all these kids are not Robert's kids, John Aaron's like, huh, that might be a good thing at this point because that Joffrey kid is a piece of work. 
So John Aaron, Hand of the King, starts investigating, but then he dies mysteriously. Isn't that interesting? It, it's never said, but it seems likely that Cersei had him killed. Now, let's just look. So this is one of the first instances that we have in which Cersei sort of crosses over into this other world because killing bastard children in this world is not that big of a deal. You're not as, as queen, it's not going to be that big of a deal for you in the society to, you know, it's not going to be smiled upon, but, uh, it's, it's not a huge, uh, it's not a huge story to people that, Oh, you know, the queen killed these bastard kids. So, uh, so this is where Cersei really crosses over into a, a, a realm that sort of cascades in a sense. And so it's likely that Cersei poisoned, had someone poison John Aaron and had him killed. I think the help of the, the maester, by the way. But anyway, so just imagine you're Cersei and you know that your three children, your three beloved children whom you love more than anything, and you love, so you love Jamie and you love your three kids and you hate Robert and you hate everyone else. <laughs> you, you just love Jamie and you love your three kids. And then uh, all the while, every day that goes by, you're just terrified that someone is going to figure this out or someone's going to say something or because it, if the entire society and the entire court or even most people decide that this is true, then you're done. You know, Robert will have you killed and your kids will be killed. Life is over for you and your children. Imagine that. So not only would life end for you, which would be terrible, but your own, your three little children. And think of little Tommen and little Marcella. These, these, you know, forget about Joffrey, you know, sadistic little prick that he was. Little, little Tommen, little cute little Tommen. So if, if word gets out, that these kids are, are Jamie's kids, then little Tommen is going to be killed. And so she has a choice here. She can either just sit back and hope that nothing happens, or she can take control. And she's a woman of action. And so she conspires to kill John Aaron to get rid of uh, that element. And, and, she, and it works, you know? So imagine that, too. Imagine that one. You are thinking, okay... Uh, what do I do here? I could kill John Aaron. I could try to seduce John Aaron. I that you know I could try to do this or that. And there's what do I do? What do I do? Okay, I'll 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 conspire to kill him. Okay, I killed him. Hey, it worked. And boy, what a load off my mind now that he's gone. Wow, killing people is a very useful thing. <laughs> and she learned this long ago, perhaps when she killed her friend when she was fifteen. And perhaps when she killed the bastard kids. So, you know, there, there's sort of a ramp up to this in terms of killing killing the hand of the king is, you know, that's a big deal. If you think about today, it's like, it'd be like killing the secretary of state or something. It's different. If you're a psychopath, that's a different kind of thing than if you just killed one of your friends, right? This is pretty dark conversation when you bring it into the real world. But anyway, she essentially killed the secretary of state. And the, you know, that's, that's a big, and she got away with it and it benefited her. So just think about how that would solidify or reward that behavior and how she proceeds from that point forward. She, she's been socialized by her society and by her own life to kill again, that when she gets pushed into a corner, just kill him, you know, just get rid of him and everything will be fine. And I'll save my children. I will save my children from death or torture or something if I kill other people. So that's a very important point in her development as a human being. But let's take a break, and when we get back, we will start at the beginning of the TV show and the books. All right, we're back. Again, the most important thing you can do if you want to support the podcast is become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. I know there are thousands of you who listen to the podcast and are not patrons. So if just a portion of you decide to become a patron, this podcast could 
uh, I could dedicate more time to the podcast. I already dedicate quite a bit of time, and I would love to dedicate more time, <laughs> more deep dives, more more time for me to research things, more time for me to become knowledgeable enough to talk about things, and that all depends on you. So if you haven't already done so, please do that. That, that probably means you have to actually go to your computer or whatever you use to browse the internet, and you actually have to go to patreon.com. Okay. Now we are at the beginning of Game of Thrones TV show and the books. The first book being A Game of Thrones, which is in the larger book series called Song of Ice of Fire. Okay. So it, we first introduced to Cersei as she arrives at Winterfell. Robert is coming to Winterfell to ask Eddard to become Hand of the King because, because John Aaron is dead. And so Robert Baratheon is like, well, who do I trust? Well, I trust Eddard, so I'm going to go to Eddard. And while Cersei and Jaime are at Winterfell, Bran is climbing his way across the Winterfell uh, castle. I don't know what you call it, Winter Winterfell walls, and discovers that Cersei and Jaime are having sex. In the books, they describe this in full detail, <laughs> and there's a lot of graphic things that Bran sees. And in, in the TV show, it's less so. And Cersei and Jaime are kind of panicking, and Cersei demands that Jaime do something about Bran. And so Jaime says something like, the things we do for love, and pushes Bran from the tower. Bran almost dies. When he wakes up, he doesn't remember anything, and he's lost his ability to walk. Later in the books, Cersei yells at Jamie for pushing Bran out of the window. because, And she says, you know, we could have intimidated him to be silent. Which honestly seems a little silly to me because that doesn't seem like a Cersei thing to think. And also, it doesn't seem likely that Bran would keep silent about that for the rest of his life. Uh, so I'm guessing that Cersei was just looking for something to yell at Jamie about and found that to yell at him about. I mean, it seems uh, like a more uh, logical thing to yell at Jamie for not making sure that he died, right? But anyway, so after Arya and Joffrey have their spat in the woods as as Eddard and Robert Rathian are heading back to King's Landing after Eddard agrees to become head of the king, Arya and Joffrey have this fight in the woods and Arya runs and hides in the woods. This is when Joffrey was bullying the boy. Cersei seduces Jamie and says that I want you to, Jamie, I want you to hunt down Arya and have her killed for what she did to Joffrey. So if you, so, um, but anyway, in the end, Jamie tries to do this, tries to, and, and admitted later that if he found Arya, he would have killed her. But Arya was found by the Stark people, and then Cersei pressures Robert to order the execution of Sansa's direwolf because they can't find Arya's direwolf. And so Sansa's direwolf lady is executed, and of course Eddard carries that out because that's the noble thing to do, or the honorable thing to do. Okay, so pet owners, just think about this. So in modern times, it would be Trump. So Trump's son, you know, that that little kid, he's bullying some underprivileged boy. And then you witness this bullying of Trump's son, and you try to stop Trump's son from bullying the poor boy. And then Trump's son pulls a gun on you, and your, your pet dog, who is a very loyal, wonderful dog, jumps on Trump's son to stop him from shooting you. And then Trump's son drops the gun and you pick up the gun and you throw it in the river. And then later on you get, you get caught and then you're sitting before Trump, Donald Trump and Donald Trump orders the execution of your sister's dog because of what happened. Imagine how upset you would be <laughs> at that. So th that was uh, all Cersei's doing. Now, on one hand, you could say it's because Cersei is a terrible psychopath. But on the other hand, you could say it's because she's very protective of Joffrey, which you could say both are true. All right. So back in King's Landing, Cersei is looking for a way to kill Robert. She's done with Robert. She hates him. Joffrey is old enough to become king. 
And so she just wants to move on to the next phase of life. So she wants to get rid of Robert. And the only way she can do that is, is to kill him. Plus by killing Robert, she eliminates the threat of being found out that the sons are not, or that Joffrey isn't Robert's son. And so she really needs to get to this next phase in order, in order to solidify her security and her power. And at first she plans to kill Robert. She plans to have Robert killed in the tourney in the TV show. You remember Robert's trying to put on his, his armor. It can't fit and Ed Arden and him are having a laugh about it, but that didn't work out. So Cersei is, is looking for a way to kill Robert. Meanwhile, Eddard Stark is figuring out figuring out that her three kids are not Robert's kids, and Cersei is beginning to panic around this. You know, as I was saying before, imagine the situation. Soon, because of Eddard, everyone will know that you've been secretly sleeping with your twin brother, and Robert will find out and kill not only you, they'll kill you, but also your kids or banish them or something, then there would be a war probably between your father Tywin and between the Baratheons and the Starks. And people would start to suspect that John Aaron was killed by you. And there would just be total chaos. There would be a lot of dead people. She's sitting there thinking, if Eddard gets this out there and this is discovered, not only will me and my kids be killed, which is a terrible thought, but also the entire realm will be thrown into chaos. There will likely be a lot of people dead because of this. Or I can kill Eddard somehow. <laughs> so what should I do? <laughs> and what now she has a third option. So to say, well, I can I can try to kill Eddard, which isn't great, but you know, for, for me, because if I got found out, it's kind of risky. Or I can let Eddard talk and risk killing me, my kids, and everyone else. <laughs> So what could I, what's a third option? So uh, Cersei tries to, you know, so Eddard comes to Cersei about it, which is weird. But anyway, Eddard says, hey, Cersei, I just want want to let you know, I have proof that your children are not Roberts. And Cersei strangely admits it. She's like, yep, you're right, Eddard. It's true. This is in the books, not TV show. It's a little different TV show. But anyway, Cersei tries to seduce Eddard. She says, well, the third option is, you know, kill, kill Eddard, you know, not easy, difficult, risky. Don't kill Eddard, <laughs> total chaos. Or if I seduce Eddard, then problem solved. So she tries to seduce him as she has done with many people before him, but she doesn't know Eddard. Eddard is the most stubbornly... Um, uh, honorable person of all time. He's not persuaded. He's not persuaded. <laughs> He's not persuaded. Eddard then says, I'm going to tell Robert about this. And I just want you to know that I'm going to tell Robert because I want you to flee with your children. Because when I tell Robert, he's going to kill you and your kids. And I don't want that to happen. Uh, so I want you to get out of town. What a nice guy. You know, super nice guy. But what a stupid guy. I mean, you're telling Cersei, the one person who is already conspiring to kill you and Robert, why would you tell her? It's just, it's everything could have been solved if he would have just gone straight to Robert with this. But he tells Cersei first, which is a big mistake. But it's the honorable thing to do, right? You, you, you're you going to tell Robert, and then you're going to let Cersei get away with the kids. And and maybe actually Eddard was thinking about the big picture here that if Cersei and the kids manage to get away, maybe Tywin won't go to war against Robert for killing Cersei, right? Because if Robert goes into a rage, kills Cersei and the kids, Tywin by necessity has to uh, revenge blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so maybe Eddard was being political there, but it seems more likely that Eddard was just being the super nice guy that he is, overly nice guy, and didn't think the whole thing through, or didn't know that Cersei was as ruthless as she was. Well, before Eddard can tell Robert about Joffrey, Marcella, and and Tommen, J- 
Just then, Robert is injured while hunting a boar. The boar, you know, attacks him, gets him with his whatever boars attack with. <laughs> and I've never hunted boar, so, you know, forgive me. But anyway, Lancel uh, Lannister, which who is um, Cersei's cousin, you remember him from the TV show. He joins with the High Sparrow. Lancel, now, so normally Robert drinks wine when he does everything. He drinks wine all the time. But apparently there's this thing called strong wine. And Lancel switched the wine for the strong. So, so Cersei's like, okay, Lancel, my cousin, I'm, I want to kill Robert and you're going to help me. The next, and so, and Lancel is like squire for King Robert. And he says, okay, when you go hunting next time, I want you to switch out strong wine because this will get Robert super drunk and will raise the risk of him being injured and killed. And Lancel does this, that. Robert gets super drunk. And I'm just trying to imagine what strong wine is. Is that like Colt 45 or something? Or in college, I remember there was this thing called Night Train that w- we would find in stores. It was like s- this cheap, f- what they called fortified wine, which I'm trying to imagine what that is. I'm guessing it's cheap wine with ethyl alcohol infused into it or something. But anyway, so he gives Robert night train and I mean, night train. What? I mean, that just sounds like a nasty drink, right? Imagine a big bottle of something called night train. (laughs) Although a lot of alcohol names are funny. I mean, Colt 45, that's a gun. That doesn't make any sense. Um, Old English 800. Old, I guess English, you think of beer, but I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> strong wine. He gives him, Lancel goes strong, gets super drunk. Robert does indeed get super drunk and gets injured by a boar. Everyone knows he's going to die soon. He's his, He has a huge wound in his gut, and they know from experience that if you have an open wound in your gut, you die somehow. And at this point, Eddard could tell Robert, by the way, your children are not your children, and Cersei even confirmed this. So, uh, th- you know, you should know that because, and I know Joffrey to be a sadistic dumbass. And so, so Eddard at this point could completely save everybody, but he decides not to tell Robert again because he's trying to be nice. By trying to be nice to Robert because he doesn't want to hurt his feelings on his deathbed. He doesn't tell Robert that these kids are not his kids. Maybe because he thought, well, maybe Joffrey will be okay. You know, maybe, you know, maybe Joffrey will be okay. I don't know. But just, it's just interesting that if Rob, what could have happened differently if Robert had, had Eddard told Robert uh, at this moment. But anyway, big mistake. Robert dies. Joffrey is crowned. Cersei takes control. Cersei accuses Eddard of conspiring against Joffrey, which is true, and throws him in the dungeon. She convinces Eddard to confess and take the black. Eddard agrees, but Joffrey, if you remember from the TV show and from the books, Joffrey impulsively orders his men to execute Eddard. They chop off Eddard's head. And at this point, if you hadn't read the books when you're watching the TV show, you were just like, whoa, this is going to be that kind of TV show (laughs) where they kill the main character? Like... I mean, believe me, when I was reading the books, I, I was like, well, wait a second, I had to go back. This can't have happened. I mean, Eddard's the star. He's he's the main dude. He's the good guy. He's he's done everything good. He's he's the golden warrior. And Joffrey just chopped his head off. Ah, you know. So Cersei did not want Eddard to have his head cut off. I'm sure Cersei would have loved to kill him, but she was thinking in terms of politically – you can't kill Eddard because if you kill Eddard, then House Stark and all the northern men, the bannermen of, of Winterfell, will, will have to go to war with us, and we need to avoid that. So let's not do that right now. But Joffrey, because he's a sadistic dumbass, impulsively orders his men to kill Eddard, and Cersei's like, ah, bah, 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 and then head cut off, and then Cersei's like, oh, shit. So then the War of the Five Kings begin uh, between Joffrey, Stannis, Renly, 
Rob Stark and and Balon Greyjoy. Whenever you think about the War of the Five Kings, you think, okay, well, you got Joffrey, you got Stannis Baratheon, you have Renly Baratheon, and of course, you have King of the North, Rob Stark. Who's the fifth king of the War of the Five Kings? It's Balon Greyjoy. Uh, for some reason, he also said, I'm king too, and even though he's completely ineffectual, or just relatively ineffectual, but anyway. Jamie is captured during the War of the Five Kings by Rob Stark in a battle, and Cersei is very distraught about this. Again, she can only depend on one other adult, and that's Jamie, and needs Jamie, and he gets captured. So it seems as though Jamie ha- or uh, Cersei has le- legitimate, genuine love for Jamie, and uh, to soothe herself. <laughs> What does she turn to? Well, her cousin Lancel. She has sex with Lance, Lance, Lancel. I'm not sure if I'm saying Lancel right. I'm sort of pronouncing it like Denzel Lancel. Maybe it's Lancel. I don't know. Anyway, Tyrion convinces Cersei to allow Marcella. So now Tyrion is hand of the king for Joffrey. Tyrion convinces Cersei to allow Marcella to go to Dorne to strengthen the alliance between the Baratheon Lannisters and House Martell. Uh, another big loss here for for Cersei. So not only is her brother and lover and husband-ish person, Jaime, captured by Rob Stark and potentially executed, who knows what will happen to him, and, and, but her one of her three children is sent to Dorne. And skipping forward in the story here, she never sees Marcella again. Marcella, uh, on her way back home, dies. And so that is, she, she's, she's losing one of her three kids, which was not good for her. And she blamed Tyrion for this whole thing because she's convinced that Tyrion is just trying to destroy her by selling Marcella away. But, uh, and it's maybe Tyrion is, but Tyrion did have reasons for this anyway. So then we have the Battle of the Blackwater during the War of the Five Kings. And if you remember this from the movie and from the books, she invites all the noble women for a party in one room. And every, all the women are like, oh, we're here for a, for a party for the Battle of the Blackwater. But in re, or we're here for protection. We have these guards to protect us. But in reality, she had them all there because she plans on killing all of them in case the Battle of the Blackwater goes badly. She plans, she's ordered the guards to kill all the noble women so that they can't be hostages if the battle is lost, which is sort of weird considering that all of her family would likely be slaughtered if the battle of the Blackwater went badly for her. So why would Stannis even need hostages at that point? But maybe Stannis would keep Joffrey alive and, you know, so that he could negotiate with Tywin or I don't know. It's that, that one's a little confusing to me, but anyway, that's that scene. Tyrion is injured in the battle. And remember Cersei hates Tyrion to this point. In fact, I think it's implied at least in the TV show. I forget in the books. It's been a while since I read the books, but Tyrion is injured in the battle. And I think it's because Cersei actually hired someone to try to kill him in the middle of the battle. So by her, she tried to hire one of Tyrion's own men to kill him. And so while Tyrion is, is recovering, Cersei uses this time to influence Tywin and turn Tywin against Tyrion, which works. And when Tyrion wakes up, he's been stripped of all his power. And now he's afraid that Cersei will have him killed, like she tried to do during the Battle of Blackwater. Tywin, at this point, is like, okay, Cersei is getting a, uh, a little old. She, she is now a widow, and I can use her for political gain, which is completely normal for this world and for this time in Europe, and I'm guessing in royal families all over the world. And so Tywin's like, okay, who can I marry Cersei off to that will benefit the house? Because remember, Tywin is all about the house. He doesn't you know, he's not a warm, cuddly dad, which can't be good for Cersei. And, and by the way, in the books in particular, it's very clear that Cersei and Jaime are desperate for approval from Tywin. So Tywin plans to marry Cersei off 
And Tywin was like, okay, how about Cersei hmm, marry Balon Greyjoy? Remember, one of the five quote unquote kings as a way of gaining the alliance with Balon Greyjoy against Rob Stark. Because if because if Balon Greyjoy joins, because you know the Iron Islands are in the north, and so if Greyjoy allies themselves with the Lannisters, Baratheons, then the Greyjoys can come in from behind on Rob Stark or something. Anyway, also Tywin was like, "Huh, how about I marry Cersei to Oberyn Martell, the Viper, or how about Theon Greyjoy? Imagine that one. <laughs> so instead of Balon, how about how about the Prince Theon?" Imagine Cersei and Theon getting married <laughs> and several other men, princes and kings and stuff that she was thinking, or, Ty, or princes anyway, that Tywin was thinking about marrying off to, or not princess. Anyway, young men. Um, then the Rob wedding, the, the Rob wedding, <laughs> the red wedding happens. Rob is killed. Also around this time, Renly is killed by the Stannis ghosts. Uh, Stannis loses the Battle of Blackwater. He's powerless. Balon Greyjoy never had power, so basically Joffrey has won the War of the Five Kings. It's decided that Joffrey will marry Marjorie Tyrell instead of Sansa because uh, that's a more important alliance because the Tyrells are an important group of people. And then Cersei proceeds to torment Sansa for the fun of it. And Cersei is now slowly realizing that her son, now that Joffrey is king, she is slowly realizing that her son is a sadistic dumbass. And, you know, just imagine how embarrassing that is. He, you're just watching the king act like a dumbass, and you're, the, you're his mother. So she's embarrassed about that. But she also is thinking, well, he's the king, so he gets to do whatever he wants to do, so screw it. Then Joffrey is killed right before her eyes at his wedding reception, the feast for the wedding. This is nicknamed the Purple Wedding. It's not, you know, officially in the books called the Purple Wedding, but it's it's a fan nickname because it's called the Purple Wedding because purple is the color of royalty. It's also the color of the purple amethyst in Sansa's hairnet, where the poison came from, came from a amethyst in Sansa's hairnet. In the books, it's a necklace thing, or in the TV show, it's a necklace thing. Also, the poison turned Joffrey's wine from red to purple, and also Joffrey's face turned to purple as he was choking. <laughs> That's why it's called the Purple Wedding, which I have to say was a highly satisfying moment for me in the books and in the TV show to watch his face turn purple. Cersei blames Tyrion for just yet another thing that Tyrion shouldn't be blamed for. And she has several people testify against Tyrion, that Tyrion was the one that poisoned Joffrey. She is totally convinced. She's not just against Tyrion. She is 100% convinced that Tyrion killed Joffrey. She's 100% convinced that Tyrion killed her mother. She's 100% convinced that Tyrion sent Marcella away just to spite her. She, she had, according to her cognitive reality, she has a lot of reasons to hate Tyrion, and she hates him. Tyrion calls her trial by combat, and of course you remember that terrible scene in which the mountain splits the viper's head open <laughs> like a melon. Uh, Jiminy Crickets. Um, I'm remembering that in my head right now. But anyway, Tyrion escapes with the help of Jaime and Varys, and Tyrion kills Tywin on the way out. So this is a huge, huge loss for Cersei. In the span of a very short amount of time, her son dies before her eyes. Now, all of us hated, everyone hated Joffrey. I'm guessing even his own brother and sister hated Joffrey, but there was one person who loved Joffrey, and that was Cersei. Cersei loved her kids. She, there's speculation, people will write about Cersei as if, you know, how could she really love her kids? She's a psychopathic, terrible person. But I, if I could crawl inside Cersei's limbic system, I believe I would see genuine love and affection from a mother to her children. She certainly acted that way in the books and in the movies. There's evidence that maybe she just needed them for political gain, but I, I think she's human in some level, and which is why she's such an interesting character. I mean, she you know she was not a Ramsey Bolton, you know she's not she's not like Ramsey. She seems to have some normalcy to her, some humanness to her, and I think she genuinely loved 
loved her children and Jamie. And she, in the span of a very short amount, amount of time, her son dies before her eyes just and is killed by her brother, she thinks. And then her father is murdered by her brother. Imagine that one. You know, your son is murdered by your brother. Then your father is murdered by your brother. That's a traumatic experience. And Cersei experiences a wide variety of motion of emotions at this point in the books. They don't really portray this in the TV show so much, but in the books, she is she's quite emotional, which is natural, right? I just imagine again telling me that she's a human being. There's a there's a there's a humanness to her that we could all relate to. So, but there's one huge gain in her life during the Purple Wedding. Jamie comes back, and Jamie, uh, you know, Brienne of Tarth brings Jamie back. Jamie asks if he can tell everyone about their incest. He's like, look, my hand is cut off. I thought I was going to die. I've, I've turned a new leaf here. I'm done with this whole society thing, and I want to I wanna announce from the mountaintops that you and I are in a relationship. Uh, you're uh, Tommen is is Tommen's king now, or Joffrey's king now. I can't remember exactly when this conversation takes place. Br- you know, Robert's gone. The War of the Five Kings is over. We're in control, honey. Can't let's just come out and and then we can just be out in the open about it. I think Jamie was quite desperate just to get closer to Cersei at this point. Plus, Jamie doesn't really understand politics as as much as Cersei does, and so uh, Cersei's like, uh, no, we can't. We can't tell everyone about this. And Jamie's like, "Well, what about the Targaryens? They, there was, they were brothers and sisters had were married all the time back in the Targaryen days. Why can't we just be like them?" And Cersei's like, "Nope, let's not do that." I think maybe even because Cersei didn't want Jamie to have power. I don't know, but anyway, so Cersei does that. Now, at this point, Cersei is hell bent on finding Tyrion which uh, alienates Jamie because Jamie is not so convinced that Tyrion I mean T- Jamie was the one who let Tyrion go right but then Tyrion kills Jamie's father so that can't go over well with Jamie but Jamie's Jamie has a warm place in his heart for Tyrion Jamie leaves King's Landing to fight in the Riverlands and this is basically the last time up until the end of season 6 of the TV show and end of book 5 of the books that Jamie and Cersei are uh, nice to each other. <laughs> but anyway, Cersei takes complete control of everything now that Tommen is king. And Tommen's very young at this point. I, I, I don't know exactly how old he is, but I, th- I think he's like, in the TV show, he seems maybe like he's 12, 13, 14 or something. But in the books, he I think he's like seven or eight. I mean, Joffrey was only 12 or 13 when he was king in the books, and Tommen is, you know, two siblings down, and so I'm guessing he was like eight or something. And so so Cersei takes complete control of everything, and she becomes paranoid. She, she becomes one of those classic rulers who thinks that everyone's against her, and instead of trying to make friends, she just proceeds to make enemies. It's sort of like Stalin Russia or something. She, she instead of being political, she just eliminates or gets rid or, you know, demotes her enemies and just promotes a bunch of yes men. And that's, and, and she's pretty emotional at this point. She's not, she's not very smart in the things that she's doing, but she's quite determined and she starts to get rid of the Tyrells in terms of their their positions of power. She's drinking more. She's gaining weight in the books. She obviously doesn't gain weight in the TV show, but she does in the books. Or not obviously, but they don't show her gaining weight in the TV show as far as I remember. But she she's she's pretty emotional. And we need to take a break. And when I get back, I'll provide some psychological blah, blah, blah about that. <music> Okay, we're back. Before moving on here, just remember to rate us on iTunes, please. If you do, let me know, and I will send you some swag. 
Also, tell a friend or a colleague about it. If you're in the field, tell some, you know, tell one of your colleagues. Send an email out. Let other people know because that's how people find out about this thing. Okay, so in in the in the TV show, it's not as apparent. I think they, I think at some point, Cersei's drinking is commented on, like, "Geez, you're drinking a lot." But in the books, it's they have much more time to go into Cersei's emotional life and how she is exhibiting some kind of emotional difficulty. Again, her son is murdered by, she believes, by her brother right before her eyes in front of a huge crowd. That is a traumatic experience. Again, for us, we hated Joffrey, and so it was the opposite of trauma for us. It was it was a wonderful, <laughs> elated experience. But for the, you know, for Cersei... It was terrible. Imagine your your 13, 12-year-old son is is murdered by your brother in front of a crowd of people and and slowly dies by suffocating and is in utter pain as he dies. That's a that's a terrible experience. Then your brother proceeds to kill your father. That's going to take a toll. That's that's big time grief. Her father was a huge uh, source of security for her. She always knew that her father would save the day because he often did for the sake of the house. And now she's just on her own. Jamie doesn't seem to be interested in leading. Tommen is an eight-year-old child. She's basically in control of the Seven Kingdoms. And people have been conspiring yeah, bef- prior to Joffrey's wedding to kill Joffrey, at least one person. And maybe someone will try to kill Tom and maybe someone will conspire to kill her. I mean, she has reasons to be paranoid. So she's grief stricken. She is justifiably paranoid. She is upset. She's angry. She is determined to find Tyrion. And Jamie isn't around to comfort her. She's all alone. And she begins to drink. Alcohol is a very effective tool to calm the nerves. When you're going through traumas, when you have... It's sort of like in the movies in the olden days, they people would be upset and they would always offer you a shot of bourbon or something. It, I don't know if you've seen these sort of scenes, but you know, someone's like, quote unquote, hysterical. They're like, oh, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then someone's like, you know, here, have have a shot of whiskey. It, alcohol will slow your nervous system down. It, it actually slows your n- nervous system down so that your, uh, and numbs you, right? I mean, I'm not saying anything that you guys don't know, but, but I think that George Martin was smart to include this. And she starts to gain weight, which means that she's losing one of her prime sources of self-confidence, which is her her beauty, assuming that gaining weight means that you're not as beautiful anymore in this world. Uh, I'm not quite so sure about that. But anyway, uh, actually, no, that's confirmed because Cersei is in denial of her weight gain because she wants to stay beautiful, and she thinks that her servants are slowly are like gaslighting her by making her dresses smaller and smaller and so she yells at her servants to, saying that why are you making my dresses smaller or something like that so she's quite upset about gaining weight so she's not happy about it anyway we see here that Cersei's psyche is is starting to take a serious downturn and keep that in mind as we move forward in the story that she has been massively emotionally impacted by what is happening right here and she is in she's trying to you know control seven kingdoms with several factions and lots of you know the game of thrones right all these people are trying to gain power well she fails at gaining control of the seven kingdoms partially because she is paranoid, but also partially just because of the way the kingdom was situated. It was just a hard 
sort of machine to to control. And even if some smarter person was in control, it, it still might have been tough after the War of Five Kings. So the, the kingdom is in a lot of debt, and there are a lot of angry factions, including the church. The, the church was, was quite upset about things, which the people are very supportive of the church. And so the people are upset, and it's tough, and things aren't going her way. So again, little Tommen is an ineffectual king. Marjorie is Marjorie, the, the queen. And Cersei is trying to control. Things are falling apart. And her self and Tywin isn't there to help her. Jamie's not there to help her. She's all alone. Uh, Tyrion could have been there, there to help her, but she he's on the run in Essos. She uh, plots to kill some of her enemies. And at this point, Marjorie is starting to gain power over Tommen. So Marjorie becomes the main threat to her power in a very real way because Marjorie is the queen. She's the queen. She's the wife of the king. And so, so technically Cersei has less power than Marjorie. And she, Cersei does not want Marjorie to take power. Now, instead of making friends with Marjorie, which is what I would have done given my personality, <laughs> I'd say, hey, you know, let's be friends and let's let's be allies and and blah blah blah. But instead of doing that, she proceeds to try to get rid of Marjorie, which is another example of of the way Cersei operates. Again, she doesn't trust because she was given a life in which she couldn't trust other people. She could only trust Jamie and her kids, and so she manipulates the system in this in this Game of Thronesy sort of way to get the High Sparrow into power. And she seduces men into framing Marjorie for adultery and treason. And so the, so she thinks the High Sparrow is her ally since she managed to get the High Sparrow into power. And she uh, gets the High Sparrow to arrest Marjorie for adultery and treason. But then the High Sparrow also, it's a long story, and you a little bit of us portrayed this in the TV show, but the High Sparrow arrests Cersei as well. So her whole plan to get rid of Marjorie backfires in getting her arrested for things that she actually did. So she tried to frame Marjorie for something that Marjorie didn't do, and then proceeds to get arrested for things that Cersei actually did do. And so Cersei is and you've seen this in the TV show, is humiliated and tortured. And she asks for a trial by combat. And she's like, I'm going to win that one because I got this mountain thing on my side. But Tommen outlaws trial by combat, saying that it's a, it's a way for rich people to uh, snub their nose at the gods. Is that another phrase? I'm terrible with these idioms. Snub their nose. Anyway, Tommen outlaws tri- trial by con combat and which is a total betrayal to to Cersei. Again, let's just look at this from Cersei's standpoint. She's like, okay, this whole plan backfired. Holy crap. I'm now being tortured and beaten by these religious zealots and I'm I'm in prison for the first time in my life. This is terrible. And my one way out of this is trial by combat. And then I'll get out like, you know, the way that things should be since I'm a privileged rich person. And although this is terrible and humiliating, I'll fight my way back. Well, then the one of the, now, so Jamie's kind of gone at this point and she basically just has Tommen at this point. Marcella's far away. Joffrey's dead. She hates everyone else. She just has little sweet Tommen that she believes loves her. She has Tommen that loves her. And then Tommen is convinced by Marjorie, I think. Well, maybe not Marjorie, but anyway, the High Sparrow and all those other people. I think Marjorie too. But anyway, Tommen is convinced to outlaw trial by combat as a direct affront to Cersei. And so Tommen has been subsumed by the church who is against Cersei, and now Cersei has nobody. So again, think about that. Her own son betrayed her, and this is rock bottom for her. She's in total despair. She 
is thinking, my God, I am truly alone with no power, no way out of this. So, and, and by the way, which it wasn't really portrayed in the book or the, or the TV show quite well, is that she could be beheaded because of the things she was being accused of. The things she was being accused of, she, she could be put to death. It wasn't just like prison time or something or pay a fine. The things that, that the High Sparrow was accusing her of and, and others, she could die. And so it really... So the trial by combat being made uh, illegal meant Tommen was basically killing Cersei. He was, by eliminating trial by combat, Tommen was saying, basically, the system now has the power and almost the duty to kill my own mother, which is kind of a mind screw for Tommen. So Cersei confesses to having sex with Lancel and many other men but not Jamie. So Cersei confesses to some of it, hoping that if she confesses to some of it, she'll get away with a lesser sentence or something, which is unclear to me exactly what that means. But anyway, she's allowed to leave the Sept to await her trial. She is completely shaved. In the TV show, she's she they leave some hair on her head, but in the books, she's, she's completely shaved uh, of all hair. And she's stripped naked, and she walks to the Red Keep from the Sept, and there's a bell, and this is in the book too, shame, shame. Everyone yells at her. They throw nasty shit at her face. And on her walk, which is not portrayed in the TV show as well as it is, as severely as it is in the books, on her walk, she starts to mentally break down. She starts to hallucinate. This is a a very difficult moment for her emotionally and mentally. She starts to hallucinate that she sees Eddard in the crowd who's dead. She sees Tywin in the crowd who's dead. She sees Tyrion in the crowd. She sees her son Joffrey in the crowd and many other people. And she she starts to lose it and she breaks down and she's crying, but she manages to make it to the Red Keep. Okay, now... We are in the TV zone. We were in the zone of the story that is beyond the books. In the books, after the point when she gets back to the Red Keep, she Kevin Lannister, who's in charge at this point. So when Cersei goes to the prison, Kevin Lannister comes back from... Because uh, Cersei basically made it so that Kevin would leave King's Landing. When Cersei's in prison, Kevin comes back and says, okay, I'm, I'm taking over. And Kevin does a pretty good job. And Kevin's smart. So, you know, Cersei, the nasty, psychopathic Cersei, has been imprisoned and is coming back to the Red Keep. And, and Kevin in the books is smarter than Kevin in the TV show. He's in the books. Kevin's like, okay, so I have no use for Cersei, and she's a huge liability, and she's prone to revenge and killing people and doing all these horrible things. And at the very least, she's a chaotic element in this story. So I'm going to make, I'm going to marginalize her and make sure that she has no power. And so Kevin gets rid of all of her servants. He gets rid of all of her guards. And I think he even sends her to Castle Rock to just basically rot away, not in prison, but, but you know, basically in house bound, if that makes any sense without any power. Kevin is very smart in the books in that way. Now, uh, looking forward, I suspect George Martin intends on a completely different path for Cersei than the TV show, but we'll find out. But in the, in the TV show, this is a a very different situation. Nobody, checks Cersei's power upon her leaving the um, the the prison. There, she still has people who are loyal to her. And and this is the moment of truth for her. <laughs> she has she has reached a critical crossroads. She could face the music and go to the trial and probably get executed. Or she could fight back. But, but how can she fight back? Because And I'm sure this is what she's thinking. She's thinking, okay, I'm not going down without a fight, but, but what can I do? I could kill the High Sparrow, 
but that won't work because the people will rise against me and other high sparrows will replace him. So, so let's not do that. Uh, I could kill Marjorie and get rid of her, but Tommen won't be happy with that, and Tommen might turn against me. He's already kind of turn, turning against me. So I don't know if killing Marjorie... Plus, if I kill Marjorie, the High Sparrow will still, will still you know, put me on trial and kill me. I could kill Tommen, but that would make Marjorie the ruler. And plus, if I kill Tommen, then Stannis would be king. <laughs> and that doesn't make... You know, so she can't kill Tommen. She could run, but how would she survive? And I always, by the way, I always wonder why people don't run more often. I, I have a feeling like writers are like, well, if they run, that sort of ends the story. But but in my mind, that's what I would do. I'd probably just, well, fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'd rather be a, a poor peasant on a farm in Essos than be killed in Westeros. So, uh, but maybe that wasn't an option. You know, Tyrion managed to get away. So why couldn't, I mean, she could get a bunch of gold, maybe get a couple loyal servants and just head out of town. But maybe that's not an option. Maybe she would be really recognizable, but Tyrion certainly is recognizable. I I don't know. So she obviously didn't decide that. She decided to stay. You know, you could say that's consistent with her character, which is a fighter. So Cersei says, well, I, I can't go to this trial because I'm probably going to be executed. And I can't take this in a measured, slow way. The only way out of this is if I kill everybody. (laughs) So Cersei decides, I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill all y'all. And she gets someone, I think, Kyburn to put wildfire under the Great Sept, where the trial is going to take place. And on the morning of the trial, she gets all dressed up but she doesn't go and she manages to get Tommen not to go. She prevents Tommen from going to the great sept. And once everyone is there, she blows it up. And again, this is not in the books and I have a feeling that this won't actually happen in the books, but this is what's going on in the TV show. And just a side note on this. I, I have a feeling that George Martin doesn't know how to write the last couple books because Books, books four and five, if you've read the books, I hope you can relate to me in that books like one and two are just awesome. It's particularly book one. But as the series progressed, he started introducing more characters instead of focusing on the ones that we loved and cared about. And he wasn't really wrapping up any stories. And so to me, I don't know if I think George Martin may have painted himself into a corner because it's hard to imagine how he's going to wrap this story up. I have a feeling that he's going to not wrap it up; that he's just going to end it basically on cliffhangers at the not cliffhangers, but I have a feeling that it's not going to have a satisfying ending. You know, Harry Potter, the books in the end, uh, the end of book seven, it's all it's satisfying. You know, Harry, spoiler alert, Harry Potter wins, Voldemort dies. You know, some other people die too in the battles, but but mostly everyone survives and and it's a happy ending. Well, I don't think George Martin writes like that. And I don't, I think everyone hopes he's going to write like that because I think that's what people want. And and he's given a lot of interviews about how he's going to write. But I, but even from my interviews, the interviews that I've, that I've read and listened to, I'm not confident that George Martin will be able to write an ending that will be satisfying. Now, the TV show producers who are in conversation with George Martin, by the way, and George Martin always approves of these things. And I think George Martin has even said, look, the TV show is going to go a different direction than the books. But I think the TV show people know how to wrap this up. And I think they know what the fans want. And uh, season six kind of proves that. There were there were a lot of things that happened after the point of the so the books end and then the TV show continues beyond the books and and pretty much everything that happened after that threshold was crossed there's a lot of very satisfying things that happen right that the fa- fans are like yeah and so I have a feeling that um, 
things are going to... And, and I think the blowing up of the sept is, is part of that. Although you're not going to go like, yay. I think it's actually a good writing uh, move because it's a way of elevating Cersei very quickly to absolute power so you can kind of move the story forward. Plus, it eliminates a bunch of secondary characters that you d- you no longer have to write for. Um, for instance, the High Sparrow is now dead and all of his followers. You don't. You no longer have to write anything about the High Sparrow and all the religious people. Queen Marjorie is dead. Mace Terrell is dead. Kevin Lannister is dead. It, I, I wonder, um, what's her face, Terrell, the grandmother Terrell? I don't think she's dead. I think she's back at home. Uh, Sir Loras Terrell, the Knight of Flowers, he's he's dead. Just all these people are just eliminated uh, in in one fell swoop, and so now you can concentrate the stories on on Cersei in terms of being in total power, and tr- you can focus on on Daenerys. You can focus now on Sansa and Jon Snow and on Bran. Like the stories are. A lot of side stories are being eliminated by this, by this. But anyway, so Cersei, in a true stroke of infamous genius, she just blows everyone up in one fell swoop. And Tommen learns of this. I think he even sees the sept blowing up, and he's like piecing two and two together, and he's thinking, okay, my mom prevented me from going. The sept just blew up. My mom's okay. Wow. My mom just, you know, it, Tom has been through a lot. <laughs> In a very short amount of time, his father died. His older brother was murdered by his uncle. He, I'm, I think Tom believes that Tyrion was involved. His, his older sister was murdered by the people in Dorne. Have I talked about that yet? You know, that's another huge loss for Cersei, right? Um, the, uh, then his mother kills his, his wife and many of his in-laws and many of, and, and his great uncle and many other people, and he's still the king. So by law, he now has to kill his own mother. I mean, just think about that one. Tommen's thinking, my mom just killed my wife and the high sparrow and all these other people. And I am the law. The king is the law. Therefore, I have to arrest my mother and have her executed immediately. And, you know, this is too much for the little guy. He He's a fragile, nice, empathic, sweet little boy. And it's too much for the little guy. So he kills himself in an amazing scene in the TV show. Again, not in the books, but maybe not likely. Cersei is crowned king of the Seven Kingdoms because everyone else who has claim to the Iron Throne is dead. I don't, maybe there's some kind of weird line of succession that would not include Cersei, but Robert's dead, Joffrey's dead, Marcella's dead, Tommen is dead, Stannis is dead. Stannis only had one kid, and she's dead by this point. Renly is dead. Renly didn't have any kids. All the main Tyrells are dead. Kevin Lannister is dead. Tywin Lannister is dead. Lancel Lannister is dead in the explosion. Jamie isn't around and probably couldn't become king anyway. Tyrion is an enemy of the state. And so, so it's Cersei. Cersei is queen of the Southern Kingdoms. And she dons her Darth Vader outfit and sits on the Iron Throne in the TV show. Jamie returns to King's Landing, I think during the coronation, and Jamie looks sideways at his sister who was being, who's, you know, being crowned. I'm very curious to, to find out how Jamie feels about all this, because at this point in the story, he seems to have a moral code and is not likely to be super enthusiastic about what his sisters has done. But if history shows anything, he is extremely uh, devoted to his lover sister. But anyway... All right, so now I'm going to speculate about the future of Cersei. And before moving forward, I just want to tell everyone that I hate it when people spoil things for me. So I'm here to tell you that I have no insider knowledge 
and I'm as I said earlier, I'm usually wrong about predictions of storylines. So just keep all that in mind as I talk about this stuff. But I th- I think it's it's interesting to get, think about what the future for Cersei is. And again, this isn't spoilers because I just don't know. And if you're listening to this in the future, you know the answer to these questions. All right. So in the books, in books six and seven, George Martin, I'm guessing that Cersei will continue to suffer and be laid low. She She's one of the narrators. So in the books, if you haven't read the books, each chapter is narrated by a different character. So, you know, chapter five, Sansa tells her story. And chapter seven, Cersei tells her story. Originally, Cersei was not a narrator. And then somewhere around four, book four, book five, Cersei became one of the narrators, which is interesting because George Martin loves to have his narrators suffer. He, you know, the narrators typically are the ones who we identify with and they tend to suffer a lot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing that her, her story in the books will not mirror that of the TV show. If I was to take a guess, I'm going to guess that Cersei will continue to hit rock bottom in the next book and that she'll manage to climb somewhat out of the hole but still not have that much power because that's typically how George Martin tends to do these things. But we'll see. Because at the end of book five, she is being kept down by Kevin. Now, maybe she'll figure out some way of eliminating Kevin and returning to power. I don't know. But all that presumes that Tommen is still king. You know, Who knows what's going to happen in the books? I, I have a feeling that the books are not going to be as, as, again, as I said before, as satisfying. I think there's just going to be a lot of meandering. Because George Martin, I think, has a, he has an interesting relationship with the readers, I think. Uh, on one level, he writes in a very entertaining way. But on another level, I think he is constantly attempting to subvert our expectations around what happens. Because I think one of his big points that he's trying to make to all of us is that life is not fair and there is no happy ending. I think that is one of George Martin's primary social engineering goals. And so, I don't know. Anyway, but the TV producers have a different sort of goal. They, they want to make money and to be praised. And so they're choosing a different tact. So on the TV show... I think now that we have Cersei, Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, I think there will be a major battle between Daenerys and Cersei. I predict that Daenerys will win this battle, and Daenerys and her dragons uh, will then proceed north to battle the army of the dead. It it just seems like a, a likely battle that will happen between Daenerys and the army of the dead and the White Walkers. It's the whole song of ice and fire, right? You have the fire-breathing dragons against the frozen undead. It seems like it'd be an unfair battle because when you have fire-breathing dragons that fly, it seems like there's not much you can do against that. But maybe the White Walkers will have some sort of magic against the dragons. In fact, ooh, maybe one of the dragons will be killed and turned into a cold-breathing dragon. Cold, you know, you know if you're a D&D person that will appeal to you, white dragons. But anyway, I predict that Daenerys' army will defeat Cersei. Danny will become queen of the Seven Kingdoms and sit in the Iron Throne. And I I predict that Jaime will kill Cersei. No idea, but that's what the witch said, right? Uh, But that, uh, I'm guessing, will happen because it'd be pretty pretty poignant event in the storyline. And I'm guessing that Cersei will actually ask Jamie to kill her because Jamie would never kill her in cold blood. So, you know, that'd be a badass way to die, right? For Cersei to say Kingslayer, kill the queen or something. I don't know that I'm not a writer, so don't listen to any of that stuff. But, but regardless, Cersei, I believe in the TV show, she has to die eventually. I just can't see any other option for the writers. I mean, she's so evil. And Daenerys would never ally with Cersei, in in my opinions. And and Danny has to, in order, again, the whole 
army of the undead they are the ultimate bad guy right there someone has to defeat them someone has to battle them and it doesn't seem like that's going to be cersei it has to be Daenerys and the dragons and so in order for that to happen it it seems likely that cersei has to be unthroned and killed maybe maybe Daenerys will keep cersei alive i don't know Maybe Daenerys will even just circumvent King's Landing altogether and just go north to attack the army of the dead. I don't know. So there's just a lot of questions that I have. All right. I need to take a break, but when we get back, we'll talk about Cersei's personality. I'm going to treat her like she's a client and comment on how her personality developed. Okay, we're back. I have, in a very lengthy, deep divey sort of way, talked about all of Cersei's story. Now, let's analyze her personality. I've already commented quite a bit on her personality, but just to really concentrate on this for a second, let's talk about her early childhood. Things were mostly good for her. She had a good mother. Joanna was, I think, a warm, good mother. She had a tight relationship with her twin brother that that had not been interfered with yet. And everything was going well for her. Tyrion wasn't born yet. Her mother was still alive. And although Tywin was gone a lot and wasn't a very warm father, she had she had her mother, and she had Jamie, and everything was good. Then around age three or four, she's caught experimenting with her brother, and she's shamed, and she doesn't know why. I mean, imagine you're three or four, and you're just kind of fooling around with with your brother. And then you're abruptly separated from your brother. And she's probably given the impression that she's done something very shameful. And she's probably given the impression that she doesn't deserve to have her brother because she's some sort of shameful pervert or something. Again, you're three or four years old. Your, your notions of life are not very complex or very wise. And so you you tend to internalize a lot of these things and it could feel like an abandonment from Jamie and some affront from her own mother. Then around age four uh, or no, at age four, her mother dies suddenly while Tyrion is being born. Tyrion arrives. Dad is still gone. Jamie is her only attachment, but she's not allowed to have that much contact with him. And she has no caregiver. She has only servants. So she went from total bliss to total unbliss. And she feels abandoned by everyone. She's hurt. She's angry. She feels weak and vulnerable. And she doesn't talk about that, but I'm guessing she does. And she targets Tyrion with all of her anger. She makes Tyrion feel her pain. This is an externalization of an inner conflict. In object relations terms, she's she feels weak and vulnerable. And she perceives other people as abandoning her or harming her or both. And so she internalizes this relationship of the weak, vulnerable self and the abandoning, harmful other. And this internal, con- this external conflict is made internal. And she has battling forces inside of her as a young person between telling herself that she's, that she's weak, she's vulnerable, she's not worth it, she's worth abandoning. And then she has another side of her that just desperately wants someone to love her and to, to be there for her and to be a a warm presence and a non-shaming presence. And so to cope with this internal conflict, she externalizes part of it by, by, ex, by making Tyrion, by projecting onto Tyrion the weak, vulnerable self and identifying with the abandoning, harmful other. And then proceeds, because she hates the weak, vulnerable part of herself, because that's the part of herself that led to so much pain for her. And of course, she's not weak, She's just human, but we would all love to get rid, like Spock, of our emotions, right? And so she has this fantasy that if she projects the weak, vulnerable part of herself onto Tyrion and attacks it, she can become stronger. And of course, this never works, but it's a fantasy of the ego, and that's what she proceeds to do. And she proceeds to attack Tyrion, making him vulnerable, make, making him weak, pointing out his weaknesses and abusing him. Also, she learns that she can control people with her power and her sadism and her aggression and her sexuality. And she uses all of these things in a false way of trying to stave off abandonment. 
She seduces Jamie a lot to keep him close. She seduces a lot of people to have power in a, in a desperate attempt to have some security in her life. Then she gets married, and she romanticizes marriage. It's all good. In her mind, marriage is the oasis where she can finally have a husband and, and children who love her, and she can finally have emotional stability, like a fairy tale. And she needs this fantasy as a young person. She needs this fantasy to cope with all the vulnerability and the abandonment she feels. But then she gets married, and her husband, who is supposed to love her and cherish her, her husband cries out, Leanna, while they're having sex. And she realizes, wait, my husband doesn't love me. He loves someone else. And now I'm stuck in this marriage. And then she gets pregnant, and she aborts it. And this is another trauma for her. And her husband is getting drunk, and her husband is getting violent, and she's once again abandoned. And she turns back to Jamie, but she has shame around that because that's wrong. And she has to hide around that. And she decides that no one else can be trusted. And she also learns that she has to fight for security, otherwise it'll be taken from her. She pushes Robert away, and Robert pushes her away, and her, her marriage becomes a sham. But all the while, she has to act like everything's fine because she's the queen, and it's important to uphold appearances. And so she returns to the sexuality she knows she can control, which is her mainly through her brother Jamie. And she feels comfortable in that place. It's, it's like when you are abused as a child, and you choose an abusive spouse, partially because it's the love, it's the devil you know, and it's the love you feel comfortable with. When you were growing, if you were abused as a child, you grew up associating love and warmth and affection with abuse. And that's the one thing that I'm always sort of beating into a therapist's head and students' heads, is that because a lot of times uh, uh, a trainee will come to me with a case and and they'll say, so the father doesn't live with the kids anymore and he was abusive and he's, he, you know, he's a bad element in this family. And then the kids come in to session and, and they have a lot of good things to say about the dad. And the therapist is thinking, why are you, you know, this is what the therapist is thinking and telling me, why is this kid talking uh, saying good things about this dad. I mean, this dad is a monster. And what I always say is, although the dad is indeed a monster, it's still the child's father. And the child still desperately wants love and attention from this person. And that will never end. I have clients who are 60 plus years old and are still desperate for their abusive parents' attention. It's it's paradoxical in that the more abuse that a parent will commit against a child, paradoxically, the longer the child will long for attention and love from that parent, which makes some sense, which I won't go into. But anyway, so she, Cersei, when she was growing up, her one place of love and affection was through her brother. And so when she, as an adult, when she is upset, she returns to that, she recreates this, and Jamie too, that similar context of involving her brother, being secret about it, having shame involved in it, having it being just her and Jamie against the world. And so this is a very comfortable place for her to find love and security. But of course, she's not, she's very ambivalent about it because she can't announce it to other people and it's, it can't last, right? So she's between a rock and a hard place. She either gets the, warm, the warmth and love and affection and security and attachment or, and, and, and has to hide it and has to be shameful about it. And, and if outed, she could be completely stripped of all her power or she could deny herself love and attachment and just drink all the time. So she, she has no option, no good option in that situation. And deep down, I'm guessing that if I got Cersei into therapy and she were to trust me, she would tell me that 
deep down she feels like a dirty little worthless girl the way she was made to feel by her family when her and Jamie were discovered and that she instead of trying to reject that identity she just identifies with it and says fine I'll be the dirty worthless person that everyone hates which is what people will do sometimes when you treat someone like a worthless person and like a terrible human being, then people say, screw it. Okay, fine. I'll be terrible. I'll be that person. If that's how you consider me, fine. I'm going to be that person, which just furthers the tragedy. So she manages to have three children, and she loves these children. And, you know, these are good attachments for her. She doesn't think that they'll ever, that they'll ever leave her because they can't leave her. And she finally has legitimate security and attachment with these kids. She can't be open about her attachment to Jamie, but she can be open about her attachment to her children. And so you can see how a human being so desperate for love and affection in her life would be so attached to her kids and so protective of her kids. And, you know, that's my thoughts on that. But then... John Aaron comes along and Eddard Stark comes along and they threaten to take away this security. And so she takes care of them. <laughs> In a way, learning lessons from her father, Tywin. When, when Tywin would find a barrier, he would take care of it. Uh, I'm a little tentative in terms of that because I, I don't know if Tywin conspired to like kill people behind the scenes the way that Cersei did. But, but anyway, so she takes care of them. And then Tyrion seemingly takes away her son by killing him and takes away her daughter by sending her daughter to to Dorne. And then Tyrion kills her own father. Then her daughter is killed, partially because Tyrion sent the daughter to, to Dorne. And Tyrion becomes the total focus of her anger. Then Marjorie steals her last child from her, Tommen. And so she conspires to get rid of her, first by locking her up in the church and then by murdering her along with everyone else in the Great Sept. So when you really understand her story and how each thing progressed, and if you sprinkle in a genetic disposition for psychopathy and lack of empathy and impulsivity and a lack of fear, then you get what you get. It's a progression. She didn't she didn't just start by blowing up the sept and killing hundreds of people. It was a progression and a story that in my theory is a story based on her attempt to gain attachment and warmth and affection and also a way of coping with grief. I believe deep down she's a human being similar to other people, again, with a pretty big slice of psychopathy in there, which is not very typical, but there is something human in there, I think. And she isn't like Ramsey Bolton. She is, she's, she's more like us. Uh, I I would say in the scheme of things, she's not as bad as Joffrey, (laughs) but she is definitely, so you got Eddard on one end of the spectrum (laughs) And on the other end of the spectrum, you have Cersei, Joffrey, and then Ramsay. Anyway, so let's look at cluster B personality traits. We have narcissism. Is she narcissistic? Well, not in the clinical sense. She's not constantly trying to make herself look good in other people's eyes. Although you could say that her constant efforts to gain power is a sign of narcissism. She was very ambitious, which which is a red flag for narcissistic personality. It was particularly noticeable when Tommen was king. You know, she she could have just kicked when when Tommen. This is a very interesting part of the story, right? When when Tommen became king, and Marjorie was gaining power as queen, Cersei could have just kicked back and said, "Look, all all my enemies are dead. the The realm is stable. I can let the small council run things, and maybe I'll even be on the small council. Who knows?" but maybe not. I'll just kick back, enjoy my time, have sex with Lan- Lancel, and just let Marjorie have power. No big deal. Marjorie seems like a nice enough person. 
She's not going to destroy me. She'll probably just be fine. But she couldn't have that. And this is one of the major turning points in the story. Cersei has a lot to do with how all the story plays out. I mean, just think about it. If she had just been like one of the other queen mothers, queen regents or whatever they call them, everything would have been fine. But no, she had to grab for power. And so she conspired against Marjorie by getting the high, you know, high sparrow into power. And then Cersei gets wrapped up in that. And then Cersei has to take revenge. And then Cersei has to kill everybody. So it's just interesting how that all played out. But is that narcissistic? Uh, I would say that her thirst for power was for self-preservation and for an attempt for emotional security, not necessarily for narcissism. Remember that narcissistic personality is based on the notion that when you are truly narcissistic as a young person, when you're one, two, three, four years old, and you're super narcissistic, you think the world revolves around you, because you should, because that's developmentally appropriate, when you're that age, you're denied something. And what she was denied was Jamie was ripped away from her, and then her mother was ripped away from her. And so because she had those incursions on her limbic system and in her brain development and in her attachment, she was arrested in that phase of life in which she would become narcissistic. Now, if she were truly narcissistic in the sense of the personality disorder, she would have been more boastful, she would have been more show-offy, she would have been more envious of other people. And whenever I say this to people, people will say like, well, surely she was very boastful and, and very envious of other people. And yeah, you can make an argument for that. But when you have a personality disorder, it's very apparent. You, you're not typically very... If you have narcissistic personality disorder... You don't hide it because it's it's compelled to come out of you, partially because you think you're completely justified in in doing it, and also partially because there's so much energy behind the personality disorder that you just it it becomes clear very quickly, and the way that it becomes very uh, clear very quickly is people will either talk so much that you can't get a word in edgewise, so upon, and you, everyone knows someone like this, right? When you talk to them, they refuse to let you talk. And even if you do get a word in, they don't really listen or they talk over you and they just proceed to talk even more. This is, this is narcissism. This is a result. When, when someone's three or four, you want to tell your parents a story, and you don't care if it lands well with your parents. Little Johnny comes back from preschool and says, Mommy, Mommy, I want to tell you what happened. And then Mommy's like, oh, what happened? And Johnny says, okay, I was on the playground, and Emily did this thing. This is verbatim. Did this thing, and then I did this other thing. And then that was a thing. And then the teacher, the thing... And I, if, if you've ever heard a three- or four-year-old tell a story, you know what I'm talking about. Unless they're extremely verbal and super bright, the story doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, you're just thinking, huh, what's going on? But if you know what you're doing as a caregiver or as an uncle or aunt or someone, you just listen, you go, oh my gosh, that sounds so interesting, and, da, da, da. and you just move on in life. But if you're, if you're a bad caregiver, then, you're, then you either say, I'm not going to listen to you or whatever, or if you're abused or you die, then you're taken away from that child. And then that child is stuck in that zone. And so that's one trait of, of narcissism is you just, you, you're stuck in that place where you just want someone to listen to you. And that's, that's what three and four year olds are doing is they just want you to listen because they need that attention. They're not, they're not trying to give you a entertaining story. That's not the point of that exercise. What they want is for you to pay attention to them because that's what they need. That's what they crave. They crave that like water and like food. They need you to pay attention because that's what developmentally they need. And that's what we need throughout our entire life, and particularly when we're that age. And if we're not given it at that age, then we develop narcissistic personality and they proceed to bore everyone with our stories. And we also don't have a lot of empathy for that person. And we also didn't even care if the story is entertaining because that's not the point. The point of talking is to get attention because we were denied that as a young person. 
And the other thing that people will do is at that age of life, three or four years old, is people tend to not have a lot of empathy and, and tend to want things for themselves. And you will see well-adjusted four-year-olds go ballistic when their brother or sister gets something and they believe that they deserve it. And if you're hurt during this time emotionally, like your mother dying and your brother being ripped away from you, then you do, you're you stuck in that zone. And as an adult, you're going to feel completely entitled to other people's things. And you could make the argument that Cersei possessed those qualities, but but in terms of the way narcissistic personality disorder typically looks, Cersei doesn't exhibit that. If Cersei did have that, she would have been much more ineffectual, actually, as a political figure because people would be laughing at her more. She would just talk over people all the time. She would be seen as petty because she would worry about some other woman's dress looking better than hers or something. And so... Uh, I, she was much more in control of her faculties, I think. And so that's why I would say that she doesn't exhibit to me the profile of someone with narcissistic personality, although she definitely has some narcissistic traits. Okay. So uh, let's move on. Psy- psychopathy or any social personality disorder. Is she psychopathic? Yes, absolutely. She has no problem breaking the rules and she has no problem killing people she has no conscience at all seemingly i mean no conscience she has she potentially killed her 15 year old friend because she didn't want that prophecy to be told she seemingly has no fear even as a child which is a sign of psychopathy again due to her abandonment and her having jamie ripped away from her and her mother ripped away from her when she was young she was not given enough empathy and enough stability as a young child to develop a well-rounded personality and psychopathy emerged as a result, possibly also because she inherited some disposition to, for psychopathy from her lineage. Because you could make the argument that Tyrion and Jamie also have slight psychopathic traits as well, but I won't get into that. Is she sadistic? I would say no. Jeffrey is a better example of someone who's sadistic. He took pleasure in harming other people. Does Cersei take pleasure? Does she get off on making other people suffer? Mm, you know, maybe in some ways, but she didn't she she seemed to exhibit that under extreme circumstances, like she has the mountain torture that one nun at the end of the season six. She certainly probably takes some pleasure in that. But that seems more normal revenge than Joffrey's way. Joffrey would torture people that hadn't wronged him at all. He Joffrey would torture and do terrible things to people just for no reason, just because he really got off on making other people suffer. So I wouldn't call Cersei sadistic, but I would absolutely call her psychopathic in that she doesn't have empathy and doesn't have a conscience and doesn't have a lot of fear. Is Cersei borderline? Not really. She wasn't overly emotional and overly reactive when she was betrayed. She certainly didn't like being betrayed. She has trust issues, but but people with borderline when betrayed will often become highly dysregulated and they'll become they'll decompensate they will become they'll become out of control even for themselves borderline people with borderline personality when they are betrayed by other people and hurt and abandoned they come unglued because of the relational traumas they went through because they were abandoned and she she would have been a good candidate for borderline given her history she developed psychopathy instead but she was a good candidate given that she was abandoned at that critical age and if she were borderline, when people in her story betrayed her, she would have in the storyline, she would have she would have decompensated rapidly and become somewhat uh, unable to function because that's what happens with people with borderline. It, it once when that trauma is triggered and that abandonment is sort of poked at, 
they are extre- you know they, they become extremely hurt naturally and it's hard for them to function and Cersei re- never really had trouble functioning you know is she histrionic i would say no i won't go into the details but she didn't exhibit a craving for attention the way that full blown histrionic people do so so i would characterize her as psychopathic lack of empathy any social person and uh, leave it at that Another question worth asking is how smart, how intelligent is she? At first, when I thought about this question, I said, well, of course, she's a brilliant person. I mean, look at, she's queen now. She's brilliant. She's, she's so adept at being able to scheme and she reads people so well and she does all these things. But from another angle, you could look at it as she's not that smart because she makes so many mistakes she has babies with Jamie, her brother. She has she's queen of the seven kingdoms. And instead of just swallowing her pride and having some children with Robert, or at least one child with Robert, she has all of her kids with Jamie almost on purpose. This is a huge mistake. And if 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 I were there with her, <laughs> as she was making this decision prior to Joffrey being conceived, I would have said to her, look, Cersei, what do you think is going to happen from this? If if Robert finds out, what do you think is going to happen? This is not going to be good for you. You sh- Fine, be with Jamie, have sex with him, but have babies with Robert. If there's some way to control that, then, you know, let's 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 go with that. And then you can have everything you want. So, so that was a big mistake and not smart. She also had sex with Jamie at Winterfell. Now, they were in a tower that they thought they wouldn't be discovered, but couldn't they keep their hands off each other for just a little bit of time? And then Bran, you know, saw them. And so then they had to do something about it. And in the book, they're not very quiet about having sex. So someone walking by the tower maybe could have heard them or seen them coming out of the tower. I don't know. Anyway. Plus, Robert is nearby. What if Robert... Anyway. Then, Cersei accuses Eddard of treason and fails to keep him alive. So, another... another you could say she was not super dumb in that instance because she didn't predict that Joffrey would lop off Eddard's head. head. But, but again, she was part of that stupid thing that led to the beginning of the War of the Five Kings. Cersei makes Tyrion her enemy when Tyrion was Hand of the King, when she could have just been nicey-nice and made him a powerful ally. Again, not smart. She proceeds later in the story to alienate Jaime, which is the one adult that seems to actually love her. She also manages to get the High Sparrow into power and the Faith Militant and fails to realize that the High Sparrow is not loyal to her. If anything, the High Sparrow would be would be her mortal enemy and she met and she gets the high sparrow into power just because she in a short-sighted move wants to get rid of marjorie but doesn't realize that this is going to lead to getting rid of her she doesn't prepare tommen for what happened so when she actually blows up the great sept she tells a guard to keep tommen from going to the trial and then proceeds to take revenge on the nun and some other people Rather than going straight to Tommen and saying, Tommen, I just blew up the Great Sept. I'm so sorry. And I'm going to make sure you don't kill yourself by having these few guards watch you. <laughs> and in a, in a year, in a couple years, you'll get over this. And th- believe me, this is, this is good for the realm or whatever she says. She doesn't do that. And she stupidly allows the, the last person on earth that she loves to kill himself because of her, which is just a huge blow to, you know, that's just not smart. Unless she wanted Tommen to die, but I doubt that. I really doubt she wanted Tommen to die. And then at the end of the TV series, she's queen, okay? She's she's won. She she got what she wanted. She's she's queen. But now what? She's all alone. She doesn't have any allies. Everyone hates her. No one's going to trust her. This isn't smart. She knows enough about how this Game of Thrones works that when you're like the Mad King and you rule like the Mad King, eventually someone is going to rebel against you and kill you because the the support of the people is a big deal. She just blew up. Essentially, imagine if Trump blew up 
where the Pope lives. Where does the Pope live? <laughs> um, whatever big church is there, the Vatican. Let's say the, the Pope blows up the Vatican. How long do you think Americans would let Trump stay in power if he blew up the Vatican? Not long, right? And the people are a powerful force in the world of Game of Thrones. When, when the people turn against you, you can, they can riot against you. Guards could be overwhelmed by the crowds. Guards could, guards could go with the people and turn against you. And so it's, it's just, it, there is some evidence that Cersei just is not a smart person. And also all the problems that plagued her before, like the bad debt when, you know, when Tommen was alive and she was queen regent, she was having all these problems trying to hold the kingdom together and make it solvent. Well, all those problems are still around now that she's queen. They, those problems didn't go away. The, the iron bank or whatever the bank, you know, the main federal reserve bank, essentially, they still hate you and that's a big deal. And so it's, so now she rules over a seven kingdoms. That's everyone hates her and, at least half of everyone is just waiting to kill her and your financial situation is terrible. And I don't know. It's just, it, maybe she's not as smart as we think she is, or she's too smart for her own good. I don't know. Or she's smart, but she, her intelligence gets clouded by her emotions. I don't know. All right. The last thing I'll say about the story here is you could make a case that her story is completely characterized by sexism. She's just as capable as her brother from an early age, if not more capable. However, the best she could achieve in this society was to be a political bride or the mother of heirs, right? The mother of children who will, will you know, have heir to the throne. And although women are allowed to rise in power in this world, in this society, the Lannisters, as I said earlier, were particularly conservative. Tywin was particularly conservative and didn't want women to rise in that way. And that's that's got to be a bummer. Imagine you have aspirations and you have you want to be worth something and all you're going to be is be married off to, to create some alliance and you're going to have to move to that household and be a second-rate citizen over there. And you could say that this whole story is a result of her trying to gain the power that she feels that she deserves as, as a woman. And if the society, particularly her father, had let her have as much power as men, maybe this whole thing could have been avoided? I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thought. If we just roll back the, the sands of history, and when Jamie becomes Kingsguard, and Tywin is going, huh, you know, my daughter is, is she smart? So I could probably groom her to be head of the household. Imagine uh, that story. She becomes head of the household. She goes back to, this is after Robert dies. She goes back to Casterly Rock. She's happy ruling things over there. She has self-esteem. She has her security. Maybe she manages to marry someone of her liking and da, da, da. And that could have been a different story. And due to sexism, it pushed her into a corner that she had to fight her way out of. And so it's just interesting. All right. Again, if you haven't become a patron, if you don't remember me saying this 10 million times before, please become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. You might have to go to your computer, patreon.com, become a patron. When, when I get more patrons, it justifies me doing these deep dives. I don't know how long we're into this episode right now. This is hour three. And I spent, I don't know, 30 hours preparing for this episode. It takes a long time. I have to take a lot of notes. I have to do a lot of research. And when people become patrons, it really justifies me taking time away from work so that I could do this for you guys. And it's fun, right? It's fun, fun time, fun times. So become a patron and we can have fun times together. That sounds funny. But anyway, so trivia. Lena Hetty, I think you're, I think that's how you pronounce it. Lena Hetty. Her personal life, she's born 73. She's 43 years old, which is similar to my age. She's born in Bermuda. 
Her father was a police officer and stationed in Bermuda at the time. She moved, her, her family moved back to England when she was five, and so she moved to England when she was five. Here's a little interesting tidbit. She dated Bronn, the guy who plays Bronn in, the, in Game of Thrones. She dated Bronn for a bit, which I, I just can't see those two together. But anyway, she dated Bronn for a bit. But it was rumored, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it was rumored that the relationship between the guy who plays Bronn and Lena, the relationship ended badly, which resulted in the two being kept apart on the set. <laughs> So that's interesting. Again, I just can't imagine those two together. But anyway, Lena dated Jason Fleming for nine years in the late 90s, early 2000s. Jason Fleming, if you remember the Black Mirror season two, he he played the producer of Waldo. He's, he's that guy. He was in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels in 98 and Snatch in the year 2000. Uh, he's been in a lot of movies, but uh, anyway, she dated him for a long time. She married an Irish musician in 2007, so this is before Game of Thrones. He's not a huge musician. As far as I can tell, he's not even on Wikipedia. There's some videos of him singing, uh, but anyway, they had a son in 2010 during the filming of season one. So while they were filming season season one, she was, she was, you know, fairly pregnant and they had to use clever camera shots and costumes and body doubles to hide her baby bump. So that's interesting trivia for you. After the birth, she suffered from postpartum depression, which can be very terrible for people. She divorced or they divorced Peter and Lena divorced in 2013. In 2015, she gave birth to a second child, but she apparently hates the tabloids, so she isn't uh, open about who the father is or even if she's with them, which is, of course, her right to be private about that. But she did announce that she had a second child. So she has two kids, two fairly young kids. She's very good friends with Peter Dinklage, which I have to say makes me very happy. So her and Tyrion are very close. And I th- I've seen featurettes with the two of them pranking each other on set and stuff. Uh, I think it's rumored that P- Peter Dinklage was was cast as Tyrion and then suggested Lena be cast as, as, um, as Cersei. I think uh, from what I, the little I read about, about Lena is that I think she has a somewhat hostile relationship with the press because they've been hounding her ever since Game of Thrones began. I, it, I don't know much about this because I don't participate in tabloid media, but I'm guessing she's one of the primary targets of the tabloid media, particularly in the UK, because she's, you know, she's glamorous and she has an edge to her and she plays Cersei, which is such an interesting character. And she's a woman. I think women are often treated worse by the tabloid press. Sometimes I wish that there would be more public shaming of particular immoral tabloid people because there's so much there's so much immoral there's so much immorality in the tabloid media and 95% of people would say that's not right you can't do that now of course you don't want to make a law against it because it's freedom of the press but but a lot of what we do in our society is dictated not by law but by social norms well when you're a tabloid press person you're a faceless person and you you're on the other side of the camera and so you do bad things and then you get paid for it and me and you might even look at the tabloid and go like wow whoever did that that's not good but i'm glad i know because i love this sort of information but imagine if these tabloid people were somehow outed and it was made known what they were doing i think it would happen less you know, like in the Amanda Knox documentary on the Netflix Amanda Knox documentary, that one guy who was uh, outed for being very, uh, I don't know the word, terrible as a tabloid press person. You know, maybe that, maybe some of that would curb that sort of behavior. I don't know, because it just seems terrible. The, the sort of, and a lot of it is sexist too. A lot of it is targeted against women. 
and has to do with how they look and, ooh, she's aging, ooh, she's fat, and ooh, she got dumped again, and ooh, she, you know, when's someone going to give her a baby, and da-da-da. It's just a lot of really awful things that I imagine is not good to the person that it's all being said about, especially when it's lies. There's a lot of tabloid information that's just flat-out lies, like with the Amanda Knox situation. Watch that documentary. That'll open your eyes to some terrible tabloid stuff. But anyway, all right. So Lena Hedy, I believe that's how you pronounce her name. Hedy, Lena Hedy. I don't even know if it's Lena or Lenny. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to say Lena Hedy. Filmography, she, she's been in many, many movies. It seems like she's in at least one movie or TV show each year starting in the early 90s, none of which I've seen. But I, I've seen Brothers Grimm in 2005. She was in Brothers Grimm. In 2006, which is the role I really remember seeing her first in, she was in 300. She was Queen of Sparta. Uh, she was in, I don't know why I talked in that voice just then. But then the one role I love her in is in Dread from 2012. She plays Mama, Madeline Madrigal. And Dread is not for everybody, but I think it's a great movie. It is a, it's a fun, interesting story. And I liked it. And Mama, uh, Lena Hetty plays the bad person. She was also in the sequel to 300. And obviously she was in Game of Thrones. And she was a voice actress in the Game of Thrones video game, the Telltale game released in 2014. If you like video games, you will love the game. Of, uh, well, I, I'll just say, I loved the Telltale Game of Thrones. I've played other Telltale games like the uh, Walking Dead telltale game and didn't like it as much it was just a little it was interesting for a little bit but it got a little boring but the game of thrones telltale games is just so interesting if you're a game of thrones fan play the tell even if you don't like video games because it doesn't play like a video game it plays more like a choose your own adventure book and it has some video game aspects to it but for the most part it is just another episode of Game of Thrones, the TV show, but you get to participate in some of the decisions. And they have all the characters do their characters. Lena Headey does Cersei, voices the Cersei character, and Peter Dinklage is in it and others. It's pretty interesting. She is reportedly, according to Wikipedia, an activist for animal rights and LGBT rights, which is great. In 2017, she became one of the highest paid actors on television, earning $1.1 million per episode. $1.1 million per episode. So that means that this next season, uh, due to her participation in seven episodes, she'll get 7 or $8 million, which is money well spent, because I'm sure it's making a shit ton more than that. And so pay your actors well. Uh, awards. She's never won an Emmy or a Golden Globe, which is very upsetting to me. She's been nominated. She would. She's been nominated. <laughs> she's been nominated for one Golden Globe last year, and the the three most recent Emmys, uh, she was uh, nominated as well. But she's never won. Just as an example, last year for the Emmy for Best Supporting Actress in a Drama Series, I believe, she was up against. Constance Zimmer from Unreal, which I've never seen. She's up against Maura Tierney from The Affair, which I hear it is good, but I've never seen. And she was up against two other Game of Thrones people, the woman who plays Daenerys and the, and the girl who plays Arya. And she also was against Maggie Smith from Downton Abbey, who won the Emmy, which makes sense. I mean, Maggie Smith, she's great. But I don't know. It seems like Lena Headey should, should win. For... Her Walk of Atonement, remember that? When she did her shame, ding, shame, walk. She made the producers use a body double. Her head was digitally added onto the body of the body double, <laughs> which I don't blame her. There's a lot of nudity in that scene. I'd probably <clears throat> do the same if I if I thought it wouldn't interfere with the TV show. Because I when I watched the TV show, and they, you know, there's a lot of just like stark nakedness in that scene it's not you know just glancing <clears throat> camera work and i could not tell maybe if i rewatched it i could say oh i can see the digital but 
it looked, I thought, in fact, I, until I read this yesterday, I was like totally convinced that she had done that. So it's, it's pretty real. But anyway, they used the body double and, uh, you know, unknown as to why other than she just didn't want to do it. Uh, she also has a lot of tattoos. She has a ton of tattoos apparently. And so that would have been kind of tough to, to get rid of. In fact, she has a tattoo of, of her, when she was with her boyfriend, uh, what's his face, Jason Fleming, if I remember right, she had his name in some other language tattooed on the, on her body and then later had to have it covered when they broke up. I always just wonder about that. It's like, I suppose if you're just a hundred percent convinced you'll be with the person forever, go ahead and put their name on your body. But, uh, you know, it's taking a big risk <laughs> it, it, in my mind. And this is just me as an old person, but putting someone's name on your body is a hundred times more of a commitment than marrying them. <laughs> that sounds terrible to say out loud, but in my head, that's how it feels. Is that okay? Anyway, that is Cersei Lannister, an analysis of her personality. Her primary traumas, brother being ripped away from her and her mother dying. Sprinkle in some some genetic disposition for psychopathy, lack of empathy, lack of fear, and give her a life of strife and difficulty and struggle. Give her a husband that loves someone else. Give her 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 twin brother who is always there for her and like a warm security blanket for her. Give her the history of Game of Thrones and how things played out and this is what you get. And the more I think about her story, the more I see her as a human being. And the more I see, the more I understand her, the story and the story as it unfolded around her, the more I realized that it didn't have to be this way. <laughs> if Robert was a better husband, I'm guessing that, that things would have turned out better. She could have grown to love Robert and she could have slowly moved away from Jamie. She could have replaced Jamie's love and affection with, with Robert's. I think there was time when she was open to that. And then she could have had kids with Robert and then this whole thing could have never ever happened. Robert could have had heirs and maybe Robert wouldn't have cheated on her as much or at all because they had a relationship. It's just so clear to me the importance of warmth and affection and security in our lives. And for Cersei, she didn't have that. And I wish that she did. But if she did, then the story would be a lot more boring. A lot more boring? No, it's not boring at all. It, it would have been very boring. The story would have been very boring if Cersei had been given a good life. So in some ways, for my entertainment's sake, I'm glad that she was treated terribly. <laughs> but she's a fictional character, so it's... It's different. It's I, I'm not wishing bad things for somebody. You stop judging me. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in, C in Seattle. Again, if you like this sort of thing, please become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. Because when you do that, it's it tells me that you are seriously into this sort of stuff, and I will do more deep dives. If I had it my way, and if we get more patrons, I will do a deep dive on every single on every single episode and every single character on Game of Thrones. And I'll even hunt down the actors and try to get them to come on the podcast. So <laughs> if that doesn't trick a few people into becoming patrons, I don't know what will. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>